What is going on, everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts live stream. My name is Spidey, and I use my degree in social, my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and 10 years as an award-winning mentalist to teach people all the little secrets about reading people, body language, facial expressions, word choice. And this week, we have a really exciting panel of guests to talk about the Britney Spears conservatorship. I myself want to understand what a conservatorship is and how it works. And is this a common application for it? That's a question I've been wondering for a while now. Is this why conservatorships exist? I have a feeling I know the answer, but we brought in the experts to find out. I'm gonna introduce my panel. Uh, a lot of them don't need introductions to the subscribers. Uh, really excited about this panel. First and foremost, uh, a gentleman who has very much introduced me to this community, a brilliant man with such great insight on behavior, statement analysis. We're gonna get some of that from him. Body language. He has interviewed some of the best in the world and has a really well-rounded understanding of these concepts. Everybody welcome, Eric Hunley. Now I'm confused. Who? What? Who are you talking about? <laughs> That's not me, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, should I call, should I call someone? Yeah, I, um, maybe. I, what, is Chase, a, is Chase around? No. <laughs> uh, next up, we have someone who has been so welcoming to me on, on her own platform. She had one of the biggest and, and busiest coverages of the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial where every day she had some of the best lawyers in the world on the live stream. I had a blast there myself and I'm so thankful for how encouraging she was and welcoming. And I hope we can welcome her with the same open arms on this channel, Alita from Legal Bites. Hi, I'm so happy to finally be here. <laughs> It's like, I, I felt like this awkward thing where, you know, there's that, that friend, you've always been to their house and you're always just partying mm. there, but you've never invited them to your house. Well, this yeah. is the so, so Yes. Glad. Party at Spidey's house. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, and finally, I feel like uh, this is the uh, Beavis to my butthead. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> like, I feel like we people have, have, have sort of created this, bromance between the two of us and i'm all for it it's rob from law and lumber <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon everybody so who's beavis uh, you know what i don't i don't know i don't know but like I, i'm all for this like me and rob just started doing some collabs and then and then we just started showing up on the same streams and everyone was like oh my god they're just the best together and i'm like yeah i'm, I'm for it like we actually get along like we're like we were like best friends waiting to happen cool yeah kind of for sure <laughs> we all are, right? We're just like, look at us. We're like the Brady Bunch. Um, <laughs> and, all, and, and, and the reason I wanted to do this live is because another big guest here is, is the community. So all of you in the chat, uh, so excited to have you here. We wanted this to be something where you can contribute as well. The, um, the super chats are on. We're going to do those in, in two parts. In the middle of the stream, we're going to take a few. And then at the end, we're going to cover all the Super Chats. So Super Chats are on. But also, please comment. Give us your feedback. We know there's a lot of opinions here. Uh, and, and we're excited to talk about this. So we're going to talk about the conservatorship. And then we're going to do an analysis of, very briefly, an Instagram post that I think lends insight as to where Brittany is in her life, in her mind. And then we're going to end with a statement analysis. Uh, Eric and I are going to do that with a lot of legal questions for Robin Alita uh, of the audio that she released. So she released a 20 minute audio on her YouTube, almost instantly took it down. But obviously, you know, other people kept it and uploaded it. And there's a lot of great stuff going on. And we're going to talk about the challenges of doing analysis of only an audio clip. So I'm really excited about that. For those of you who haven't seen the Kevin Federline analysis I did a couple of days ago, that kind of relates to this. I will be okay. So we were just talking about this backstage with Kevin Federline. I really picked apart everything he said. And that doesn't mean to say that I think he's a giant monster and I think he should, you know, burn. That's not where I was going with that. Kevin Federline and Britney Spears obviously had a toxic past. We all have relationships where we made some mistakes and we have toxic pasts and we talk about them not under the best light with Kevin Federline. That ex happens to be America's sweetheart. Britney Spears who has gone through so much that we have a sensitive spot for her a sensitive spot that everyone on this panel understands. But it's only fair that if I scrutinize Kevin Federline with that microscope, we have to apply the same to Britney Spears. So we're going to talk about the conservatorship. 
I think all of us on the panel agree that there was a lot of injustice done there. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that there aren't certain aspects of Britney Spears that need help, need attention. We feel for her. But there's also some stuff happening with the behavior that we're going to talk about. Anyways, really excited to get into it. Alita, I want to start with a very big question that I have for you. What is a conservatorship? Oh, so easy. <laughs> Rob's like, Rob's like, <laughs> give her that. Yeah, give her that one. You, you, take, no, you take that. Yeah, good. So, so a conservatorship is basically it's a it's an area of of probate law actually where um, a person basically it's been dis determined through the legal process that somebody cannot make decisions for themselves either for their own health care or sort of financial and legal decisions. That's like the two ways that it kind of branches off. Um, healthcare also includes like their daily, daily care, daily needs. So, um, uh, uh, when somebody is, it depends on which jurisdiction we're talking about, uh, 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 to figure out like which sort of terms are going to be used between conservatorship and guardianship. As an example, in California, it's like under 18, over 18, but in other places it'll be, you know, conservatorship versus guardianship is like a conservatorship is the, the financial and the legal stuff and guardianship is like the medical stuff. Yeah. So sometimes the, the terms can change a little bit, but basically the concept is the same. It's that the person for one reason or another is incapable of making their own decisions for themselves. And so it's intended to be a protective process so that this person doesn't get taken advantage of and they're able to have certain things that that require consent that require you know decision making so that they can still have those decisions be made by someone who is hopefully ideally if the process goes properly which it didn't in this case you know it has their best interest in mind is that used often with elder care most often it is used with elder care. That's usually the kind of situations where either, you know, you could have a, a as an example, somebody who's, who's in a long-term coma. If somebody gets into, you know, a, a car accident or something, they're in a long-term coma or you have, you know, grandma or grandpa has dementia and over, over a period of time, it's a, that's like one of the more, more common types of cases is where, you know that their health is declining, that they are going to be, you know, that, that it is, it is continuing to, to regress. Um, and so you, you have a certain system in place. Now I, I will say that's not the kind of situation or it's not something that's necessary for everyone. You, most people that have a proper, um, estate plan in place, they'll have, um, a power of attorney. That's for like the, their like financial decisions. There's also a medical version of a power of attorney document. And so if somebody sets those up on their own when they are fully competent, they don't have to go through a conservatorship if something happens to them. Love okay. you. Thank you, Alita. Honestly, thank you. Like it's, it's been a while that I'm like, what the hell is a conservatorship? So that, <laughs> that, that really packages it nicely. Um, Rob, you have worked. I mean, you both have. But 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 mm -hmm. because the next question is for Rob, I just want to preface this by saying, Rob, you've worked with family law a lot. You have extensive experience in there, as does Alita. Um, Rob, you've served, you you you've prepared conservatorship requests, or you, I don't know what it's called. I don't know what the, the, the legal term for it is. But you've worked on conservatorships before. Mm -hmm. In yeah, most so cases, in most cases, what was it for? What was the situation? I don't think it was a pop star who shaved their head. So these things come to be in two different two different settings, generally speaking. One, you'll have a hospital referral where someone has been taken into care, involuntary submission for hospital care for mental health treatment, and the hospital makes a referral out for the appointment of a guardian conservator because the hospital has made the assessment this person is incapable of caring for themselves. Now, that incapability means an actual incapability. It doesn't mean that they're going a little bit off the rails. It doesn't mean they're making bad choices. It means they are actually incapable of deciding. And then the second one is usually a family petitioner. A family member will come to me and say, I have concerns about my mother or my father. Um, it's usually in cases of severe Alzheimer's or dementia where there's the actual mental processing is not really there. I, I mean, to the point where they don't remember where they bank. They don't remember if they have a bank account. They don't remember who their kids are. It's usually something that severe. And then we petition the court. Um, for an appointment of, in Virginia, we call it guardian of the person, conservator of the estate, but Alita is right, every state varies by that. And then when we petition the court, the court is supposed to immediately appoint someone to represent 
this person and speak for their interests before you get to the place where you're actually having the court appointment of the guardian or conservator. So there's a guardian ad litem, which is the attorney that represents the person that you're trying to take over their estate. And then there's the guardian and conservator, who's the person who's actually asking the court to be appointed this position. Question. Um, on the conservatorships, and I'm asking this because I feel like it may be where we ran into the problem. Aren't they kind of designed almost to be permanent? Like in these examples you gave, grandma's yes. got dementia. That's not going to go away. Grandma's Correct. eventually going to pass. So I, I want to add and, to that. In, in a, our, our very good friend, who is always here in spirit, uh, Emily D. Baker, in a video said, it's rare to get out of a conservatorship. It, it's some, it's, okay. And I, I didn't understand why. Uh, who wants to take this? Rob, Alita, who wants to? Uh, I mean, I can handle this. But I've never seen it. Like in all of my practice of guardians conservatorship, I've never seen it. Because it's you, the appointment itself is the people don't just regain the ability to make decisions. They don't. When the level you have to meet in order to have someone be appointed to take over your brain. I mean, imagine that. That's what it is. The theory is you're never getting your brain back. The court is charged with the uh, the court is charged with the obligation of finding the least intrusive means of adequately ensuring this int this person's interests are protected. Whether that's a power of attorney, like Alita was mentioning, um, whether it's a limited use guardianship, they get to make medical decisions only. They're charged with finding the least intrusive means to have someone be appointed a full on guardian conservator. That's the court making the determination. This person does not have the actual capacity to make decisions for themselves. And that just doesn't, it, it's not built to change. Yeah. Okay. And so is that something that maybe should be addressed? Like I know Spidey and I have talked about it on the side of what if you have to renew it every year? You know, or, or some, you know, there, there maybe should be some mechanism in place to make sure that, hey, this is still a problem. Or at least if their age is so much lower, because I, I kind of, you know, I get it. Um, if somebody is like severely developmentally disabled and they're never, ever, you know, uh, unless there's some modern science that happens a miracle, that's never going to change. Or again, Alzheimer's, dementia, again. As far as we know, permanent, never going to regress or progress, I guess. Um, should there be something in place or, you know, maybe were they using the wrong hammer for this nail is my question. Well, I will I will say that the one I've only seen one case that was anywhere near a case like this where there was a, a young man from a wealthy family who had a drug addiction. And so uh, the family was sort of not no one was in and was was positioning themselves in any way to to like rest control from him but basically there were conversations about like are you sure that you really want responsibility over your life or do you want a conservatorship and so sort of like having these conversations like that um and as far as i saw like he got close to maybe having one and then that didn't happen but i will say that the, this is also where we get into sort of like the real politic of of the legal industry in that in that comes in costs. Conservatorships already are a very costly thing because you've got you've got the conservator, they take fees. You've got the the you know the accountant on on the conservatorship that takes fees. You've got the lawyers that take fees. You've got the lawyer for the conservatee that also takes fees. There's a lot that that really comes in that you have a certain estate that you also want to be able to preserve for the life of the conservatee so that you don't run out of money while they're still requiring all of this all of this care. And so you also want to be able to be running these conservatorships in such a way so that you're not you're not using so much money on the legal process um, as well. So that's where we get into like some sensitive talk about like the realities of just how much it costs just to have an ongoing case in, in the legal industry today. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's insanely expensive to be honest. Um, and so if you add more, more restrictions on conservatorships, especially where the vast majority of them are, you know, grandma and grandpa who have de dementia and you, you know that it's not going to change. Um, there are certain, if there, if those, 
if those restrictions are put in place that are not exactly necessary, then then you start to run into wasting wasting the estate for no reason. But of course, this is not to say that there is no other abuse that exists outside of Britney Spears because there is, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's a very, it's a very delicate sort of situation. I think the way that I see it in terms of like whether, whether sweeping changes should be made in conservatorships or not. Yeah. Alita makes a really good point. I did want to piggyback on one thing because it takes a us back to the baseline explanation of this the fees for the guardian conservator and the fees for the attorneys that represent the guardian conservator come from the estate of the person that you're petitioning to become the guardian of so right. that estate is the first resource that you go to to tap for those fees and costs so they're so paying every for time their own they're jailer. in litigation so, yeah they're Britain, paying for their Britain own jail for the conservatorship and the yes. attorney's fees associated with Britain, paid for petitioning this. correct she paid for so, all of this that's so the, you, part of the issue Yep, you tap wow. those fees first. When you deplete those fees, then you go to the the uh, financial resources of the person who's petitioning to to be appointed. So you have to fully deplete the first one before you go to the second one, and then when you finish the second one, there's a state fund that you can petition to to get reimbursement for some of these costs. So you're inviting the depletion of that estate. You're also what Alita might have mentioned. It, this is some of the most controversial. I mean, I've, I've I practice family law custody cases. Those are back and forth in court a lot. They're emotionally charged. When you're talking about guardianship, conservatorship, those are sometimes some of the most high conflict cases that I have ever seen because you're talking about one person who doesn't believe they're incapacitated, mm. a family member that sides with one side of the family or the other, doctors, nurses, and now they're in a court system they don't understand. And there's a third part, which is the guardian ad litem, the attorney that's appointed by the court who can express themselves as well. Or sometimes a fourth part, which is the third party interloper. That is some yep. sort of uh, oh. some sort of uh, the new girlfriend for grandpa after grandma died. Um, or or you a know predator. some sort of a care a caretaker who came in. Um, yeah, yeah. There's there's uh, th th those are those are the situations that are the most uh, contentious. I think is when there's when there's some kind of a weird interloper that gets involved and like suddenly is 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 very, very intricately involved in, uh, in, in this estate. Yeah. So it's an incentives problem. So, potentially. so, yeah. So let's look at the timeline really quickly, like without going into too much detail, it's kind of just to give everyone an idea of what happened in order. So the date is, uh, February, 2007. Uh, the kids are very young. They're both babies at this point, two and three years old. Uh, and Brittany is making headlines because she has some kind of crazy behavior. Some people are saying she's losing it. She's, you know, attacking uh, people who are uh, the paparazzi or the press who are trying to get interviews. Not attacking, but like just being aggressive towards. Um, there was the whole shaving the head incident, which which may have been misrepresented in the in the media. There's a narrative being pushed about Brittany uh, in 2008. Well, Spidey, um, the whole shave in the head. You're you've studied psychology quite a bit. If I recall, that is a um, symptomatic sometimes of external pressures sure that uh, someone will do especially in Listen, that kind of limelight it until today we see things that britney does that could be uh quantified as sort of extreme to express her freedom to say like mm -hmm. i am trying to take back my life so people look at pictures of her posting herself naked on instagram and they go that's just cra that's just crazy behavior when you've been stuck for 13 years or people are making decisions for you, it's basically, yeah, it, it is, it is crazy. I, I wouldn't do it. I don't think anybody would want me to do it, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, uh, offend people. <laughs> you know, at least it, more, yeah. fewer people are offended. <laughs> uh, so, so it might be just her going, this is my life. Let me be. And, and <laughs> shaving the hair can be that it can be a middle finger to societal pressures and saying like, yeah. I do what I want, like enough, yeah. enough control. Yeah. So it could very well it's, be that. Especially, I mean, if, if, if it's like, you know, she's, she's being told what to eat and when, and when to dance and where and sing and perform and do all these things that it's like, what, what do I have control over? I have control over my hair. I, you know, I'm, I, I will, I will take clippers and I I'll do that because that's the one thing that I can impact. That is just me. Exactly. 100%. So, so yeah, so there's a lot of ways to look at that. But what I'm saying is in 2007, there was this narrative that Britney's going through something. The kids are young. Postpartum depression is not out of the question. There's a lot mm -hmm. of hormonal changes after you have babies for years to come sometimes. 
Um, 2008 custody disputes start with Kevin Federline. I believe this is part of the reason a lot of people villainize Kevin Federline because they feel like he's part of the reason that all this started. Again, it's easy to jump on that and go, Kevin Federline, what a loser. We all have bad breakups. We all have exes that we don't get along with and we do things and we say things and it's regrettable. And yeah, it's easy to point a finger at that. I, I believe maybe it was a catalyst, but... And we're going to look at some of the language and some of the they stuff. They weren't together at the time, though. So no, they, his, they were not. his influence is, is minimal in terms of her. He's still, the, he's still the father of the children, and, and there's yes. still a custody battle taking place in 2000. Sure. There's a strong, yeah. strong, cont very contentious custody battle. Yeah. I, if yeah. I remember but you know what? Like, what, 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 what I'm trying to say, like we all, like, we all know someone who has an ex that they see each other as the villain. But when the entire world is involved in that dispute and the entire world loves Britney Spears and the entire world knows that K-Fed is not nearly as talented as her, you have to force him into that villain role. I'm not saying that he didn't contribute to some factors, but it, it doesn't make sense to just point to him and go, He's the, it's all because of him. It's not all because of him. There's a lot of factors going into this, in my opinion. Um, so February of 2008, right in the beginning of February 2008, the father files for a conservatorship. Uh, she's in psychi psychiatric care. He gets temporary conservatorship. So, so uh, Rob, let's go to you on this. Oh, by the way, this is hilarious. The, the, the lawyer that petitioned with him, do you guys know the name of the lawyer who initially petitioned for the conservatorship with her father? Oh, gosh, please tell me. Don't Andrew, say I have an audit. <laughs> Andrew Wallet. Oh. Okay. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, because Where he was a conservator with him. I mean, Andrew uh, Wallet. Hey, at least he had a sense of irony in his, you know, his chosen profession. Andrew Wallet. Um, it, it could I be worse. He could be a banker. More description than the last name. Uh, well, I banker. mean, you know, a lot of LA professionals, like the uh, the the weatherman in LA, was his name was Dallas Rains for a long time. I don't know if he's still if he's still working there. <laughs> it's it's LA, right? <laughs> I mean, are we gonna start naming kids like Steven Scoundrel or like <laughs> you wascally wabbit? Uh, like. Bill Shark. Yeah, I, uh, I had an, <laughs> I had an optometrist when I was younger. His name was Doctor Glass. Nice. Okay. Yeah, this this is exactly in in lines with that. A weatherman with the last name Rains or a optometrist by the with last name Glass. So Andrew yeah. Wallet is the lawyer who helps Jamie um, ask for a temporary conservatorship. So uh, let's go to Rob. What what is so eventually this temporary conservatorship became a long term, almost indefinite conservatorship. What? is the difference between the two. What would compel a judge to grant one or the other? What would compel a petitioner from asking for a temporary one versus a long-term one? What it, Does it have to be a drastic difference? What Because earlier we said it's rare to get out of one. Then why do temp... If it's hard to get out of a conservatorship, why do temporary conservatorships exist? Rob, go. So I want you guys to think about this in, in this terms. Like Alita mentioned a power of attorney. A power of attorney can be in two forms. It can be one that just exists as of the day you find it, assign it. You give someone this power and this authority. It just exists for all time. That power is the same level as your own power. You both have authority. Then there's power of attorneys that are called springing, which means they spring into existence. They just, boom, they, they appear and they spring once certain triggers are met, mental health triggers. You're diagnosed um, as lacking capacity by two separate independent medical providers, and then the power of attorney springs into existence. Those that's, that's have provisions. That's usually the springing. The springing. Yeah, usually. Uh, yes. Provision. Yeah. Um, there's other ways. Yeah, but that's just using that as an example. That's the most um, common. That that's essentially like the same thing as a temporary conservatorship. They're very similar. It's it is meant and intended to to basically form a stopgap. Um, when you've got involuntary hospitalizations, when, you ho when you're hospitalized involuntarily, there is oftentimes one of these temporary conservatorships, guardianships, there's a temporary hold on your ability to make decisions until such time as you have left or been discharged from that hospital when it's involuntary. Now, every state has restrictions as to how long these can last. Some are 48 hours, some are 72 hours, some are up to two weeks. It depends. Um, but that can be extended to basically get you past this, I mean, think of a concept of like a mental break, like where you've you you have basically had all of these outside pressures and you've you've gone through this massive expression of 
resistance and uh, reluctance, teenage outburst, whatever you want to call it, but it's going to pass, right? There's, it's going to crescendo. It's going to come back down. You're going to come back to level. This is supposed to fill that gap, that time period. Got it. Could it also be used for drug issues as an example, like somebody who has a habit that's out of control. They've got to go into rehab to help keep their affairs in order, et cetera, while they recover. Nope. Nope. Okay. Rehab, rehab is voluntary. Rehab is not something you can put compulsory. They would have to sign on to it if they signed, and they off, they often do. If they sign a, if they sign away that ability, if they basically sign and say, if these criteria are met, I hereby give up these these powers. They can do that. But no, yeah, it's, it's not always voluntary, dude. Like it's often sentenced by judges. Just that's, that that's you. You are a ward <laughs> of the state at that point in time. Your ability to make decisions has been taken away by the state. So. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So, so, so that's, so that's why there's this tem temporary conservatorship. And, and, you know, so I guess this is the part where we start to hit that slippery slope because a lot of them might look at this and say, if they saw something in Britney's behavior that they thought was really, really concerning, then maybe a temporary conservatorship, if it was just going to be enough for her to kind of get her feet grounded, um, maybe it's justified. In October of 2008, the conservatorship is extended without an end date in sight. It's extended indefinitely. Um, Alita, what would a judge have to see to say that this 26-year-old musical artist is fit for that kind of a sentence, a, 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 an indefinite conservatorship? I mean... <laughs> Assuming that the judge is doing their job properly <laughs> and they're making good decisions, uh, you know, as as lawyers, we all will disagree with a judge's decision from time to time. Um, but assuming assuming that the judge is, is thinking reasonably, um, it, basically, there has to be enough enough evidence there to show that she lacks capacity. She does not have the ability to make decisions for herself. In other words, like her she what. In a legal sense, usually what we're the way that we explain that is that this is this means that this is somebody who does not have the capability of understanding a a legal document that they would be signing. They they don't have the 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 ability to appreciate the consequences of of signing a particular legal document. Like like this is somebody that just not just that they have a diminished capacity, it's that they have no capacity. And, and just as as a, a little bit of a um an example for you grandma and grandpa having dementia, going back to that example, if grandma and grandpa have, have a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's, uh, or I should actually not say Alzheimer's, but dementia, um, that alone isn't enough Why? to, to determine incapacity because, um, because there's, you still have to do like a, 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 a mental, men, like a mental fitness test, essentially, because you can, you have, you can have certain stages of dementia where somebody's mm -hmm. in the earlier stages and they still can make some decisions. Maybe they're declining, but you don't know exactly how fast they might be declining. Um, so that on its own isn't enough to just like automatically trigger like, Oh, you're done. You no longer have capacity. You, they still have to look at it on a much deeper level to figure, does this individual have the ability to make decisions for themselves? Why did you say not Alzheimer's? I should just say dementia. If I remember correctly, Alzheimer's is, is a more severe version. Uh, it's like a, some more, a more severe uh, okay. a diagnosis is, past, past regular dementia. Different. Oh. Well, Alzheimer's can be early onset and early onset is just there's a, there's a forgetfulness part. It, it attacks different areas of your brain. Dementia is where there's moments of lucidity and there is moments of complete inability to process factual scenarios. Alzheimer's is starts with the forgetfulness and it just goes in one direction. Alzheimer's goes one direction. Dementia can be all over the place. So... Mm -hmm depending on where you are on the Alzheimer's chart, as far as where you like how severe it is, that's when it can be kind of, how do I say it? Um, you've kind of passed what the court would consider a point of no return. Okay. So dementia, uh, that makes sense. I, I just was wondering because yeah. you, anytime I hear an exception, I, it triggers me. I got to know why. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Let's keep zooming through this so we will get to the analysis. I have a couple more questions. Uh, April of 2012, her fiance, Jason Trawick, 
is added to co-conservators. So he can't control any of the assets, but he can now control everything from food and clothing and medical care. So what the hell's going on there? This fiance of hers, which I don't know how long, they've been dating since 2009. So she's been with this guy for three years and all of a sudden he can decide what she eats, wears, and what kind of medical treatment she gets. What, what, what happened there? I mean, I don't know specifically what happened in this case, (laughs) but I mean, I will just say that, you know, there could have been a behind the scenes conversation with Brittany to say, who are you most comfortable with making these decisions? There could have been, I'm not saying that that is, but I mean, I'm thinking of it about it from the perspective of, let's say, you know, before this point, you know, uh, she is in a lawyer's office in an estate planning office and they are making a full package for her will, her trust, her power of attorney, her, you know, her medical power of attorney. And she's deciding who her, who her agent lineup, right. For, for all of these different, different roles, you know, like, like this is, you, you pick who you want to be your, your agent, your backup agent, maybe another backup agent after that, you know, and that can change over time too. Like right. if you're younger, it might be your parents. If you're, you know, if you're in a, a long-term relationship that you think is going towards marriage, it might be your, your significant other. It might be a sibling. As you get older, it might become your, your child, your adult child, you know? So like these things can change over time. So there could have been, and, and looking at this, you know, just, you know, without having any sort of, um, uh, any sort of like, like automatic skepticism about his motives or anything, just looking at the possibility that there could have been a conversation like that. Okay. So that, that, that actually, Alita, thank you for that. That makes sense. Because I was like, all of a sudden this fiance gets to make these decisions. What I didn't realize is that that's a role that had to be filled. And he just took that role as opposed to a role that was created. Like, all of a sudden you get to make these decisions. Somebody had to, might as well be him, is what you're saying. It could, yeah, it could have He's been there. That. He's there. He's there. Yeah. yeah I mean, um, that would make sense. It's like if if uh, going with the adults again, whoever's living with them, you know, a lot of times there's multiple children and one child will live with the, um, the parents and the other children, they just don't live. They're in different cities. They work, they have their families or whatever. And so then that one person would probably have the extra duties yeah awesome uh january 2019 her father is hospitalized she makes a statement uh that she's taking a hiatus andrew wallet resigns a lot of people resigned throughout the course of this that were so we had andrew wallet that resigned and then there was a a a, 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 a funding sort of firm which bessemer trust who also dropped mm. the so a lot of people seem to like back out of this rob is this a sign that there was some sketchy stuff happening and that these lawyers and trustees and stuff just didn't want to be involved the free britney movement had already started i think that they're starting to get some exposure and heat i i I go back to that 26 year old decision like there's there's reports the judge asked her at the age 26 you know who would you do this and you think about a 26 year old and their ability to kind of process things for long-term decisions and you're going yeah you can see the the fiance, but you can also see how conflict would arise from a 26 year old and through these years of their life, um, erratic behaviors, decisions. It could be that people had difficulty relaying their information or their decisions to Brittany. It could be that it could be, they faced a lot of pushback from other family members, from fans. I don't know that it's an indication that things were shady. I don't particularly like it. I didn't, I didn't like seeing all the people coming in, coming out because you don't create a long-term rapport which you would need to have in this one. And then I just, I don't know how you take a 26 year old and you say, this is going to be indefinite. And just. Unless they're severely developmentally disabled. It, there could be something in the medical it. file that isn't public, public knowledge. True. And this is and, something and that, that still is not yet to this day. We, we don't know. And, and I'm not saying that we should know that we have a right to know her medical file. But, you know, I mean, there, that's the, that's the one thing that holds me back on her case about her, her conservatorship is that we don't know what, what, if any (laughs) diagnoses she may have, you know? Right. And I guess though, the problematic parts of this were that she is performing at such a high level that it brought forth the questions about the finances. Like, for example, 
if the conservatorship, let's say it was not her father and there wasn't questions of incentives and it was other, like, what if it was a professional organization, financial group or what they were, who seemed to be less or, or more disinterested in whether she performed or did not perform, whether she got paid or didn't get paid, whether she had albums or did not, then I well, think it would be, there would be fewer questions. But it starts to, it, I think it, it uh, muddies the water a bit when you have, again, potential incentive problems. Well, I mean, Eric, let me give you an example to kind of push back on that. Well, let's say that you've got someone who is is uh, the ward. Um, that's what we call them, the ward at that point in time. They're the person mm -hmm. over whom you're trying to take control of the estate. Let's say they're a painter, mm -hmm. a very, very talented painter. They love doing it. It truly is something that they get so much of a benefit from, but they also profit from it. There are two incentives to keep that going. One, it's something that gives this person drive and gives them an ability mm -hmm. and desire to continue waking up and better themselves. And two, it also increases the value of the estate. The estate is also, she's res people are responsible for paying for themselves. Now, the higher up that this person becomes in the paint world, let's say they, they become a Picasso. Mm -hmm. At what point in time are you starting to, to tiptoe that line of, is this beneficial to the person anymore? Or are we pushing them too far and making it beneficial for the estate um, so far in excess of what it needs to be. The estate doesn't need Brittany to perform every freaking weekend in order for Brittany to survive. Well, that's my point, though, because you yeah. have questions about whom is in charge. Like you brought up, a, made me think immediately when you said about the really talented person, everything. Dean Martin performing with Lady Gaga, and Dean Martin, I believe, was in full on dementia, and he did that last performance with her and apparently was flawless. Like he could barely figure out where he was going, but once he got on stage, performed everything perfectly. So a lot of people said, hey, you're exploiting Dean Martin because of his age and everything else. And other people pushed back saying, look, this gave him an opportunity to perform something that he's always done and loved, et cetera. All cool. But I didn't see the financial incentive. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said, if you had a disinterested party in some ways, somehow, who was just kind of overseeing, like, okay, she's wishing to do that. Her therapists all say, this is very good for her to do. She wants to do it. We should encourage it versus that. It, my concern is the, the incentives. Again, I keep coming to incentives. Like, does it benefit all the legal staff, all 20-something lawyers who are attached to this? Think about it. The father had how many lawyers? I, I swear I heard the number 20-something. The, the lawyers have a job. That's, the lawyers have a job. It's not the lawyers. It's the person. It's And, and states have different restrictions on this one. In some states, sure. uh, the judge will appoint a conservator, but say the conservator is not allowed to draw an income from mm -hmm. the estate, depending on the assets in the estate and depending on the work the conservator has to do. Now, let's say that the conservator or the guardian of the person, let's say it's it requires full-time medical care or full-time mm -hmm. uh, supervision. That takes this person's job, the, their own ability to earn an income on their own and takes it away sure. from them. So it's fair to compensate them, but on that and that, how do you create the pay scale? So I think you're right in the incentives, but I think the way to do that is the compensation element of this and how they are compensated. The attorneys getting paid, that's a different setting entirely. Those attorneys right. are actually doing work, but the actual guardian, I think that's the compensation you need to kind of look at. Oh, it's Tony Bennett, by the way, not Dean Martin. I get confused. Oh, well. Yeah, the chat was yelling at you. <laughs> oh, they're going to yell at me more. I'm Water. sure. <laughs> yeah, um, Dean Martin would be cool, though, to see. But, yeah, that would have been neat. All right, let's let's zip <laughs> forward here. Um, so in July of 2021, I know I'm skipping a couple of things here because I really do want to get to the analysis. Um, the court-appointed lawyer resigns after 13 years on the side of the uh, – the, the one who was representing her, the court-appointed lawyer for her resigns. And it's at this point where she realizes, so that was Ingham, that was the lawyer. She realizes for the first time that she had the right, the legal right to petition to end the conservatorship. She didn't know that until last summer after 13 years. She didn't know that. Um, Felica, is this a failure on the part of the court appointed lawyer? Is do you, do you feel like this is something that should have been made very clear that he should have said at any point, like, and I don't mean just like at the yeah. bottom in small print, but like to very clearly sit her down and say, listen, at any point you have the right to do this. I, I will just say that if if I was her court appointed lawyer, I would have been making that clear in, in, in 
in writing and also in person as often as possible um, just to make that super clear to her. I don't know. I mean, again, this goes back to the, this vacuum of information that we have in the public, right? Because we don't know what her what her capability was in the conversations that they had over the years, over 13 years, especially early on. Um, you know, it, it, it could be that he had conversations with her and it just didn't connect. Um, but this is why lawyers will do a lot of CYA by following up with something in writing saying, you know, Hey, this is what we talked about today. <laughs> and you know, um, who, you know, who actually can't come out and say that they had the conversations, the yeah. lawyer, they can't come out. The lawyer cannot come out and correct her yeah. on this yeah. one. Why? Because that's a client confidentiality. Yep. The client can say anything they want. That's, that is the big hole, by the way, with the uh, Jay Ellinger um, case right now is he really can't defend himself. Ashley Morgan Smith line can say anything she wants. Britney Spears yeah. could say anything she oh, wants, this but is, the lawyer cannot because of that client um, because, privilege. Because every every privileged communication, every like relationship that has a privileged communication, we're talking attorney client, doctor patient, um, uh, the 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 penitent with the um, Priest. like priesthood, yeah, the priest penitent, you know, like all of these relationships, the confidentiality is actually owned by one of those parties. I mean, when it comes to the spouses, they they each own it against each other. But when we're talking about the attorney client privilege. That privilege is actually owned by the client, not the attorney. And what that means is that the attorney cannot waive that privilege. There's nothing. No one can compel that attorney to say what it is that the client said to them or what they said to the client. It is only the the, the client that can waive that and say, you know, yeah, I want to go ahead and, and make this public. Um, so they so the attorney can't be compelled and they also cannot like on their own just walk around and talk about these confidentialities. Got it. Um, that that sucks though, because because I, but, but here's the thing. The other thing my mind is going to is, of all the things, why is this something she would lie about? I I would like to believe that had she understood earlier on that she can petition Rob. What's where's the disagreement, buddy? I, <laughs> clients lie all the time, don't they? They, they, they do. You know, it, it's it's it might not even be a lie. That's the thing. It might not even be a lie. She just might not remember the conversation. It might just be something that wasn't explained properly. Honestly, this happens all the time. The number of people who get up and say, "My attorney told me this," referring to a <laughs> conversation that I have had with that person, and I'm going, "I never said anything of that sort," or it was said a different way. I don't put this on her. I don't put this on the lawyer. I put this on an absence of communication or a misunderstanding, but in the communication was relayed. So I, I don't necessarily know that it was a misstatement by either one of them. Okay. Yeah. I, all I'm saying is I think in a case like this, if for 13 years I'm seeing my client falling apart, because we're going to, once again, in a couple of minutes now, we're going to go to the analysis of her audio. If what she's saying is true and she was that miserable and I'm her lawyer and I'm seeing this, there, the way Alita said it, there's going to, if I have to spell it out using fridge magnets, I'm going to say, Brittany, you can petition to get out of this. The lawyer doesn't see it. We don't see it all the day. But, yeah, see it every day. That, makes me, that makes me think of something. My, my mother, when I was a kid, right, I had like horrible allergies and asthma and I would just be, you know, sick as can be. And we, we would go to the doctor and she, she complained about this for the rest of her life. We go to the doctor and the doctor would say, oh, hey, hey there, young man, what's wrong? nothing right and and so we don't know if Brittany ever talked about what was going on with her she was putting on miss mary sunshine public okay. performer Fair. happy positive image all the time and i don't know no eric that's a great point that's a great point so basically the bottom line is rob alita the next time you are working on a conservatorship for a massive celebrity that seems like it's been a little too long you bring me along and i'll let you know if they're happy or not oh yeah the next time that happens i'll let you know next time that happens give me a ring uh, sure sure sounds good okay. uh i'd love to move on thank rob alita you are the best and there's gonna be more questions in the analysis for you from a legal standpoint based on some sure. of the things she's saying and whether or not that would have been possible but i do want to move on to the analysis really quickly once again we're going to look at an instagram post that I think gives us a bit of insight as to where, where she is and what's going on. And then we're going to look at the audio clips. Uh, a few things before we do this. First of all, I keep saying this on the channel, but but I don't think there's I can over 
state this. Analysis feels sometimes like an attack. It never is. Because with analysis, we have to pick apart every single word to try to figure out what's going on. So I, with KFED, I was very meticulous to the point where a lot of people said, you're picking on him a little. I'm not. That's what analysis is. That's what I get paid to do. When I get paid in an interview for a really high-end position in a company to an, analyze an interview, I can't leave anything out. I have to look for the worst case scenario. So sometimes I'm really picking something apart. It's not me being mean. It's me analyzing. None of it goes against the fact that all four of us are very sympathetic to what's going on here. And there's a lot of stuff she says in the audio that I think are really sweet and kind and show that kindness. But there are a couple of things that we're going to look at. And I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about the choice of words. So please understand that. Also, please understand all the Britney fans. Your cause is so noble. I, I connect with that. I love that. I love that you're seeing injustice and you're going, no, enough. This can't happen. The poor thing. 13 years of her life down the drain. We all connect with that. I don't want to speak for the other three, but I connect with that. It doesn't mean that we have to turn a blind eye to the effects that the conservatorship may have had. They left her very vulnerable. This horrible thing. Spidey, you- I would say that this started long before the conservatorship. Yeah, it did. It did. It did. Of course it did. But, but think about how much something like this could be worse. It's the worst Band-Aid in the world. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, no part of this was going to help her get better or no, very no. little. Uh, it was a pause for a very long time. You don't pause the game for that long. It, it has damage. So all I'm saying is this, a lot of the Britney Spears fans who are trying to push narrative of she's a perfect little angel and there's no fault in her. She's done nothing wrong. You're not helping Britney if you do that, because all you're doing is you're showing how polarized you are and you don't see that there are certain elements of her behavior that need help. And we're going to look at all that. Just keep an open mind. None of us are saying that this wasn't unfair. Of course it was. But there are certain indications in her speech that that demonstrate that there's a lot going on there. Um, The second thing is this. I've selected clips from the audio that are most interesting in terms of statement analysis. I will leave a link to the audio in the description when the live is over, the the full audio. There are things in there that are intense. There are things she says in there that I haven't included here. And you might think to yourself, why wouldn't you include those? Those were intense things that she said. Yes, they might be intense in terms of what she's stating. But in terms of behavior and what I can look at in her words, I've selected the most important ones. Finally, the challenges of doing so, you've all seen me do behavior analysis here, body language, facial expressions, verbal analysis. The challenge of doing this audio is twofold. One, it's just audio. I have none of the body language stuff. And this is why Eric has quite Eric has quite a bit of experience with statement analysis that he's going to chime in with. With behavior analysis, we study statements. It's part of what we do. Uh, in a lot of my lie detection videos, I tell you what to listen for. But obviously, the body language is also a really big part of it. So it, it gets challenging. That's why I have to select things where I really felt like I was getting something. And the other challenge with this audio clip is that there's no um, interview. No one's asking. Thank you. It's a nightmare, dude. Let's just be honest. This audio clip is a complete nightmare to try to analyze because there's no interview. in statement analysis, usually somebody is answering something. And so like the Instagram post to me is far clearer because she's responding directly to another interview that happened. So you have um, something that happened and then her reaction, and then you can kind of look at her reaction and come up with some conclusions. Her audio, now I despise the term her truth, his truth. I don't however, her, I've been criticized. However, her audio is her, truth. her story, her experience. And it's hard for me to sit there and say, that's deceptive. That's not, it, it's, I don't know technically this is really good for statement analysis. It's almost more of a psychoanalysis, and I'm not a, a psychiatrist right. or psychologist. That's, why, so that's why I was very selective with the clips, because for that reason. this Remember, in an interview, the best thing we have in an interview as an interrogator or an interviewer is the questions we ask to try yes. to get a reaction, to see how they react to this information. She's choosing what to talk about. It's a monologue. So it's hard because we're not seeing any reactive stuff, only proactive stuff. So yeah, Eric, exactly. 
Uh, before we do this, let's take a couple of super chats right now, really quick. Uh, and at the end, we're going to cover all other super chats that come in throughout the analysis. If you have any questions, comments in the super chats, we'll cover them all at the end. But right now, let's take the ones that are here, starting with this one. Brittany shaving off her hair was the first time I thought she was getting better. When you can't handle everything and you have long hair, it's a lot of work to keep your hair clean. Uh, I think can mirror, confirm. Yeah, Alita has incredible hair. I think she's the only one who can speak to this. So, Alita? <laughs> yeah, can, can confirm. <laughs> no, that's it can, my excuse. It can be a bit really. of work. No. <laughs> yeah, Eric, 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 I don't. I don't think my hair has ever has ever been actually this long on me before. Uh, I was talking about it earlier with Mr. Bites, um, but anyway, uh, we don't need to get into a long pro <laughs> long protracted discussion about my hair. <laughs> but but I yeah, think that, yeah, that mirrors what we were saying earlier. To where we don't know the 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 reality of why she did that. You know, it could have been this gesture of like. I'm setting myself free. I don't want to live the societal norms anymore. It could have been some sort of. It could have been that... a direct rebellion to the people that were that were telling her what she could and couldn't do. And and especially because it's like when you think about somebody when you've grown your hair out uh, for as as long as as hers was at that time, you know, it takes some time. It takes some care. It takes, you know, and there are certain beauty standards that go along with that. And that is literally just saying like, you know, the people that care about her image, the people that care about what she does, what she doesn't do, what she eats, what she, you know, how she performs, like the people that are, you know, have this whole checklist of behaviors for her to, to fulfill. Um, that's also saying like, oh, you care about how I look. Do you, you care? All right. Shh. How about now? How do I look? Yeah. yeah. How about, how's this? How's that? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> uh, great. Next. I became my sister's conservator when she inherited assets after our mom's death. I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, major headache and stress. I can imagine. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. this, this, this disaster. Rob, Rob, Rob's going to blow up. Rob, what's going on? It, it's exceedingly difficult. Um, the Virginia State Bar publishes a manual for guardian conservators, and it's supposed to be for lay people. It's 17 pages long. Yeah. So it, it, it's not easy to follow. Is that the thing you posted here, the slide? I mean, yeah, you don't have to pull it up, but it's seven. It, I mean, it's 17 pages of material, and I can flip through it, that, that goes through what you're supposed to do, the accountings you're supposed to file, how you file them, what you explain, how you explain it. These things have to be confirmed and observed by um, the uh, fiduciary for the state where you are. Um, they are subject to audit. You sometimes have to disclose them to every person with an interest in the estate. You don't want to. You don't want this job. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. looks like uh, it looks pretty much as easy as uh, filing your taxes in my province of Quebec. Yeah. <laughs> also, <laughs> Rob, I'm guessing that often the person in that role is never popular. You know, I keep thinking about how you have um, a family with five children and one child winds up the hair caretaker and all the other children are letting them know how they're not doing their job right. Yep. That's got to suck, too. So this yep. is all this is a nightmare. And there's I mean, this isn't I'm not I'm not making excuses for anyone that was in that role for her. I'm just saying for anyone who takes this job on, it's it is a thankless position. Uh, and uh, Diana was in your uh, in your well, not 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 necessarily in your county, but in your state, Rob. So yeah. She says she yeah. says it was in Virginia. So it took yep. 18, eighteen months, months to get. That doesn't Sounds surprise right. me at all. Wow, incredible! And th there's like, that's good though. I mean, the way. <laughs> well, we see that maybe we shouldn't rush to get it. You know. Well, you know, yeah. Yes and no, because sometimes you have you have a situation where you've you've got bills to pay. And who, mm. who can sign off on those, who can pay those in, in those 18 months. And then sure. you've got, then, then they're late. And then you've got a home that can go into foreclosure. There's all kinds of pitfalls with that taking too long also. Yeah. True. Sure. Uh, Lucky says, Hey Spidey, we need memberships. Uh, Eric, what is, I'm so YouTube on set. No, okay. Consult me afterward. I was off the stream, off the stream setting up. Does membership mean to have to like pay to get more content? Is that is that what that um, is? Or did no, not not necessarily. You know, oh. a membership it's you whatever can offer, you want to offer. Right, you can just have a membership, and it can be nothing more than they get icons, and oh, I recommend cool. you get special icons for them. You know, that's pay that. for that, and yeah. then people get to see that they're in green, and and they're showing people that they support oh, you. Oh, love it! I always wondered when in your and, chat there was the green. I was like, what? How do they do? Okay, I thought membership meant like. I have to have exclusive content for the members. I will never do that no. because whatever I have to say, 
I want to say to everyone. And I think mm -hmm. information like this should be accessible to everyone. So I've always been against having. You can also do pre-records like a day early, though, Spidey. So that's sometimes a benefit for members where everybody's still going to get all the information, yeah. but you pre-record it. You say, hey, mm -hmm. I'm putting out two hours ahead for the members okay, we'll talk and everybody we'll talk. else. So yeah. yeah, we'll talk and, about and, it all. And Lucky also is a is a, a serial membership giver away or two. She likes yeah. to buy oh. memberships for other people in the chat. So <laughs> oh, that's so cute. I love yeah. that. Okay, we're yeah. gonna yeah, very generous. Uh, I will be speaking to my YouTube consigliere after the stream. <laughs> <laughs> so, and my lawyers are going to draft some stuff up. Uh, <laughs> how can she be capable enough to have a fiance decide to marry and need conservatorship? That's not a bad question. Alika, it's Rob, not. It's a good question. Yeah. Would, you do yeah. need to have a certain level of consent to marry, although there are varying levels of consent depending on what we're talking about. Marriage oddly enough, is one of the lowest levels of consent legally that someone would need. That's Crazy. I know, right? Well, it's, no, it's, it's, it's the it's expression just... of her decision. It, the fact that she had the capability of expressing her decision, her desire, and rationalizing it to the people that she was talking to at that point in time, if you had her talking about her relationship at that point in time and you heard her speak of that relationship, everything that she's saying in there gives you an idea of her ability to process mentally her life and lifestyle things. So, yeah consequences mm -hmm. the meaning of those decisions and yeah some of this too though like the whole marriage thing it just sounds draconian but i do think this comes out of dare i say old fashionedness or or long history where a spouse would be considered a caretaker and it could be a i'm caring for them type of scenario i'm not saying yeah. it's right or wrong i'm just saying that there's a long tradition of history where a spouse does care for a husband and You're still legally responsible to do so. There's someone mm. in the chat saying that uh, she wasn't engaged until after the conservatorship. We're not talking about that fiance that she's currently married to. We're talking about the one during. Uh, there was a three-year, right? One that she was with for three years. A uh, different, different guy. Uh, okay, great. Uh, for more super chats, we'll cover them after the stream at the end. If you have questions, comments, insights, love them. Keep them coming. Uh, also, really quick, I hate doing this, but please, if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so. Hit that like button so we get more people in here for this analysis. The more you like, the more YouTube tells people, hey, something cool's going on over here if you guys want to come check it out. And we're about to go into this sweet analysis. So really quick, I want to go through this Instagram post first. So on her Instagram, she posted a four-part uh, letter to her son. Uh, I'm not going to micro-analyze that, just a little bit of the vibe because it gives us a little bit of insight as to what's going on. I do want to say this first before I pull it up. I am very much against the children here being used as pawns. I hate that. And you can go, that wasn't her idea. You know, the son decided to take an interview. The father decided to implicate the son and she's just responding. I don't care. This isn't what came first, chicken or the egg debate. I don't care what it is. We're going to talk a lot about the development of the brain. Until you're in your mid-20s, the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. In other words, reasoning isn't 100% there. Linear thinking isn't 100% there. Uh, impulse control is not there 100%. This is why teenagers, when they argue, their argument seems very scattered, um, impulsive, because that part of the brain, which is right here in the front, is not fully developed until your mid-20s. So, also socialization. What's that? Spidey, also socialization. Yes. Like, let's be honest, part of the development is doing something in a manner that is not acceptable to your peer group or whatever around you, and then learning from that example or feeling something from them to you. And if you're not socialized enough, it makes the um, development challenges even more so. And that's why I wanted to say this, this precedes the conservatorship in my opinion, she started out as like a, a, a one of the kids, I mean, Mickey Mouse Club kids. So as a child, I mean, th this person has been performing since she was a child and has not had a, I hate to say normal because it, that, that's trying to be rude, but she hasn't had the usual upbringing or life or socialization that most of us have then rolls into a conservative sh conservatorship and is even more um, tamped down, if you will. And now she's coming out. So mm -hmm. it, it makes it nearly impossible to, 
make statements because some of the things she says, if it was somebody else, I would say that's a really weird statement. Yeah. However, with her, it's like, okay, and I can, if you don't mind, just look at the first thing. I tried my best at being the best person I be I can be. Well, what, 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 what kind of person? A mom, whatever. In her case, though, she's trying to be the best person because she is not just a mother. She's an icon. She's a celebrity. She's spidey with a crazy camera. We have no idea. <laughs> That's pointed at the family. floor. <laughs> Spidey's battery is dying. Everything, calm down. <laughs> Changing the battery or plugging it in. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it, it's really, it, it's very difficult. So, you know, if, if this is a normal person who was talking to, about a dispute with their kids or, or whatever, or standard upbringing, you'd be like, what are you talking about? What do you mean best best person? What? what, what? You mean best mother, best father? How, how does this relate to anything? You're You're kind of moving away from it. But I don't. I don't know how she sees herself because I can't even imagine walking in her shoes for a week because I've never yeah. experienced know, anything of that we, sort. Yeah. We don't know what it's like. Yeah, but, yeah there's but there's also, varying levels of of normal. There's there's like normal for the average person. Then there's normal for for Britney Spears in like the the celebrity context, and then there's normal for Britney Spears in her specific situation in the celebrity context. Yeah. So it's like trying to gauge what is normal behavior or or language or it's hard it's hard but mm -hmm. Spidey, tell us to shut up and pull up the tell us to shut up and pull up the instagram you have to you have to cut us off you have to cut us off this is your channel <laughs> no it's fine it's fine uh, there's, a, there's a really it's fine it's fine uh there's a parallel here so i do believe that we're going to see a lot of signs of britney having those scattered thoughts and and i 100 percent believe that this conservatorship or maybe not Maybe this would have happened without the conservatorship, and it's easy to blame the conservatorship. But I think something. Maybe it's the fame. Maybe it's the conservatorship. Maybe it's all the drama. All of it. All it of exacerbated it. it. The conservatorship kind of took a stuck. problem and just slammed it down. Yeah, Locked kind it of down. are stuck in that teen mentality. But the parallel here is this: that applies to the kids as well. The kids, I don't think, have had the opportunity to sit down, look at everything, and make a proper evaluation. Even if they could. There's certain allegiances that they're going to want to stick to. I don't know what they are. I'm not going to speculate. I don't like the fact that the kids are being used as pawns in here. From Kevin, Agreed. from Brittany, from everyone, leave them out of this until they're old enough to understand, to make a decision, to make their own judgment calls. Let's take a look at this uh, Instagram post. So really quickly going to read it here. So this is the third slide of four where I think we're getting a lot of stuff. Um, if you could pause for a second. So this is to her son. If you could pause for a second, remember where you came from, uh, three exclamation points. She types like she speaks uh, very passionately. I hope you can look in the mirror and remember you are my child and always will be. Since Preston didn't speak, I send my love. So that's the first part of this that goes, what, since Preston didn't speak, I send my love. Would you not send your love if he, ha if he had spoken? So Dude, that, that is the most significant part of the entire piece. That right there. Um, and I actually consulted Gavin Stone on this one too ahead of time. Great statement analyst. So oh yeah, far, far better. But well, I, one thing I love about statement analysis is most of the greats like Peter Hyde or whatever they actually work with teams. So I have like ten people who are just sitting there parsing every single word, underlining, circling, and saying why is that pronoun missing and on and on. And there's different cultural considerations like um, is this a female or a male? How are they brought up? I mean, there's so much involved. It's so, it's so what happened? What did, what did Gavin say? Well, he had pointed out, I saw it right away and I was going, okay, so you're the good kid. Sorry, but the, this is a, if, if you look at the order of the way the children are addressed, right? She went after the youngest instead of the oldest, unusual, because usually they go oldest to the youngest in order, but no, one stood out to her, one was talking. So she's mm -hmm. very upset about that. Then she made this aside here, since Press didn't speak, I smell, send my love. So you only have love for Preston. I don't know that she means it that way, but but there's anger. Oh, you know in what this. I think. You know what I think it is. You know what I think it is. And and uh, I hope this makes sense. It's like since Preston didn't speak, and I'm not addressing him in this post, I'm sending him my love through you. Like sometimes I talk to my mom on the phone or something, mm -hmm. you know, and I might be with my brother, and she'll say something like, "Oh, since I didn't get a chance to talk to your brother, tell him I say hi." I think it might be that just really poorly worded to like, since this is between you mm. and me, Preston isn't part of this. I send him my love 
through you. So make sure you tell Preston. Yeah. He, she, here's the thing. There's a lot of clues we're going to see in the audio where I, I, I'm going to push back though, because I, 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 I don't, I think she is talking to different people. Again, you're starting on slide three, go to one. Yeah. And um, who, who is she speaking to there? Yeah. She's speaking to us. She's All speaking right, to the world right, 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 right. Uh, right from the jump. So now we're saying, now I envision fair, this. Fair, and again, fair, this is interpretation. Fair, this is Brittany. Fair. She's on stage. And we're all the audience. You, me, um, Alita, Rob, we're the audience. We're watching her. And she's saying, this is me. This is what I think of what just happened. Then she turns and, well, what's her? Jaden. Boom. Looks to Jaden. Singles him out. Yeah. Says a statement. Yeah. Turns to Preston. Singles him out. Makes a statement. Now, what Gavin pointed out, which is really interesting, is there are only two places in the entire um, piece where she used commas and those Ooh. were when she was happy with somebody Ooh. and that was wow. Love it. W when um, she was pointing out about Preston and when she pointed out that she is so happy to carry four tours, Judge X Factor and way more dude that is those so cool because in the audio we're about to analyze we also see a tonal shift in those small moments where she's happy it's a very different cadence than mm -hmm. when she's not so Good job to Gavin on that. That is a great freaking catch. And um, I pushed back on him and I said, well, wait a minute. One of those was a list. But then he pointed out in the last slide that she had a list there, too, with yeah. no commas. Yeah. So the only commas in the entire thing are Preston, I'm happy with you. And mm -hmm. look at me. I did these things. I don't, uh, Eric, by the way, I don't entirely disagree. I'm just laying down all possibilities. Oh, sure, sure. Because I do feel like since Preston didn't speak, I send my love. Like, had he spoken, maybe not. But there's also that possibility of just, since you're the one I'm talking to, Jaden, send Preston my love. It, it could also be that. Also, remember, once again, going back to this scattered Britney thing, she just says things. They're out of order. Yeah. So let's continue here. I would love nothing more than to see you two face to face. Keep playing your gift on the piano. That's sweet. You and your brother both are brilliant. And I'm so proud to call you both mine. That's cute. That's adorable. Love that. Mm -hmm. As for my mental health, my dear child, understand you must learn to pick up a book and read one before you resort to even thinking about my intellect, sweetheart. So that's passive aggressive. And it's also a uh, false um, uh, equivalence. So, by the way, there's another problem. Now, this is the part that everybody in the chat's going to want to throttle me. I'm sorry. But, um, and Gavin picked it up as well. If you look into statement analysis, Avenuam Sapir, I believe, who said this to begin with. Whenever you see a parent referring to their child as child, it's a big alarm bell. Mm -hmm. Big alarm bell. And this is, this is very significant. When you find somebody and there's a the child missing situation, when they use the word child, it is a very bad oh. tell. And I'm sorry. sorry to say, but my dear child translates to you little shit. Kind of I'm, 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 I'm sorry, but it, that, it's that is 100%. A... You know what? I will say, my dear child, to people who are not my children, like in a conversation <laughs> where I want to, pat, like, meanly sort of diminish, patronize, their... manipulate. Yes, it's it's very yeah. demeaning. Now, when they're, when they're upset, heart. they'll say, My yes. son, it's my, the parent version of child. bless your heart. Yes, <laughs> anyway, so Credit. that people no, people get really, really torqued on it, but that that right there is is not not um really warm embracing loving language and again i yeah, she talks to I, preston directly multiple times in this about having, preston you i'm aware your gift so she's talking to him yeah i'm, I'm sorry i was totally starting sorry, to talk Alita. over you no 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 it's it's you were totally in the middle of things um no my i i wonder that sentence i just i have this sense that she has felt like she has not been respected by her sons for her for her intellect or she feels sure. like she has been she's been like on the back foot in terms of like her stature as a mother for her children for her competency which is something that could totally come into question for in a situation where someone has been legally told by a judge, you are not capable of making decisions for yourself. So like intellect, intelligence, competency, 
that kind of stuff can totally mess with your relationship with your kids as a mother because you know that it can undermine your your status in their life as as someone who who is an authority figure for them because if 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 the legal system has undercut all of that and your whole family has helped them do that that's something that can totally totally create a a a major chip on someone's shoulder and and make someone much more reactive to their children when they do certain things and to say things along those lines she's not reactive to the child in this one she's reactive to the public perception like she's she's reacting to the public She's not reacting to the child directly. She's reacting to the fact that the child has a voice in public that is creating a narrative and she has to respond to the narrative, but she is speaking down to. I, so, well, yeah. yeah, let's go with the rest of the statement. No, no, hold on, hold on. I'm going to really quickly debate that with a possible, with another possible explanation. And then I'm going to debate what I debated. So like, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to. I love devil's advocating the, the devil's advocate. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to devil's advocate this and I'm going to devil's advocate my devil's advocate. So yes. uh, the devil's advocate, the first layer is in the South, you often hear these endearing terms, like mm -hmm. they'll, they'll say uh, sweetheart or hun or just freely, like these endearing terms. Sure are thrown around quite a bit. The, so that's the devil's advocate. The devil's advocate to that is she continues with something that's pretty intellectually condescending by saying, you need to pick up a book, which, which is something we say when we feel intellectual superiority. So she's saying, um, my dear child, understand you must learn to pick up a book and read one before you resort to even thinking about my intellect, sweetheart. So You're I want, missing something in there too, Spidey. There, there, there's a false equivalence there. No, it's not that. What? There's something part. There's one part that that I think people are missing. And okay, let me you go with this first, go ahead, this first yeah. and then you hit yours. Yeah. So it's a false equivalence to say that because he's talking about her mental state, that he's talking about her intellect. Bingo. Are, that's it. Right. <laughs> that's, those, that's a false equivalence. Okay. So that's what you're going to say. There. That, those are two different things. It's possible mm -hmm. to say that somebody is having mental health issues while being an intelligent person. It's mm -hmm. possible to say that somebody is not having any mental health issues but they're an idiot. Those two yes. things don't work together. So with her saying, um, uh, before you comment on my mental health, you must learn to pick up a book and read one before you resort to even thinking about my intellect. He hasn't commented on your intellect. He's commented on You're your right. mental health. Those are two different things. Yep. And this again is what I was talking about earlier. That kind of teenager scatterbrain where you might say something and instead of arguing that they deflect and bring in something else and they think they're making a point this isn't much of a counter to or she happened. heard she heard him call her dumb in her mind but right. we which we can do i mean somebody can say something yeah. to me and i hear one thing because i'm sensitive about it but that doesn't mean that's exactly what they said so she is responding intellect over the mental health so that right. was exactly what i was going to bring up that exactly so so there's, that's a false equivalence then she shifts to condescending k-fed tell your father to go try and at least mow the lawn so again this is something we see a lot in teens arguing where instead of arguing the argument they argue the argumentor um hmm. or whoever they feel is the villain in this case i'm sorry you might have hmm. your opinions on k-fed listen we could say a lot of stuff about k-fed but when he took that interview with 60 minutes and you can justify this a million ways he doesn't want to rock the boat he doesn't want to do this he doesn't want to do that he was given opportunities to bash her, to condescend her. He didn't take them. So that's the one silver lining I could say about KFED. And he's done a lot of wrong over the years. You could say he's a mooch. You could say he's this. You could say he's that. But in that interview, he never said something condescending like, let's try and see her mow the lawn. So I, I don't love that statement. And again, she's had 13 years of emotions bottled up and they're just exploding. I don't know what that's like. I'll never know what that's like. So I could sympathize with that. But it was a little uncalled for here for her to go, before you comment on my mental health, go read a book. You can't comment on my intellect. Ask your dad to go mow a lawn. It's like this rampage. Um, I think that that's, that's her feeling um, isolated too, though. Yeah. To be fair to her, like, uh, like here we go. Zero. I'm trying I'm trying to finally get on my conservatorship. And now, now Knucklehead's talking to 60 Minutes. He's shut up forever. And now he's got to come out and talk. And my kids have got to talk about me. And everybody's got to talk about me. I can't even do anything. I'm trying to get married, move on with my life. Everybody's picking on me. So yeah. there could be that. And again, people in the chat are going to yeah. say like, oh, we're being we're being too analytic. We're picking it apart too much. But you were OK that's with me doing analysis. that with KFED. You were OK with me doing that to Kevin Federline. You have to accept that that's what we're going to do. I sympathize enormously with her situation. Not a massive fan of this post. 
Um, and again, it's just indicating how scattered her thoughts are. Is she entitled to have these feelings? Maybe, but it's, it's very scattered. Um, if you can honestly sit back and say with your sensible, brilliant mind, what Mima and Papa did to me was fine and call them not bad people, then yes, I have failed as a mother. So again, this is once again, a very, like you're, you're saying, if you can't see this, then I failed you. So like, you must see that. So it's pushing a certain narrative. And yeah, again, Mima and Papa were, did terrible things. We agree. But I think in the interview, didn't, didn't um, Jaden say um, they're not bad people? Didn't he say that about his, his grandparents? Because I think that she was just specifically responding to him saying they're not bad people. Yeah. So how can you say they're not bad My bad point people? is, no, no, my point is, but, but that's fine. It's fine to say, I think they're bad. I think you're wrong. I think they're bad people. Um, mm, it hurts sure. me to hear you say that someone who did that to me isn't a bad person. But to say, if you don't see that, then I failed you as a mother. I find that sure. a little, just, a little just, but again, I'm nitpicking. That's what I yeah. do. No, I agree. I, dude, I, <laughs> I agree with it a lot. Well, I do. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and, and I do, I, again, I, I don't know how many times I could say this. Of course I have sympathy. But I, I have one more thing, though, Spidey, that really, and Gavin and I talked about it too, it's very confusing to me. She's extremely consistent in a lot of things, but I want to know how she produced the statement. And, and the reason why I'm saying this is the punctuation is odd. There's always a space between the words and the period. And I can't help but wonder if this isn't voice to text combined with her punching and punctuation. And I, 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 I'm only asking this because it would reflect a little bit on what she's doing. But, you know, I've tried to make, you know, space ellipses, ellipses. And in it, it's odd because every ellipses is three periods. There's, it's consistent throughout, but she has a habit of either three exclamation points or four exclamation points. And I'm, I'm wondering, and I haven't, had the time to really go through it, but I feel like there's actually degrees in here of what she's trying to convey. But I just think that the way it's formatted makes me almost think she's saying something and then press, press, press. Yeah. Because every time I use a voice to text, not that I do it often, the punctuation, unless I say it, isn't going to be there. It's always giving another space waiting for the next word to come along. So I, I don't know if that's and, and Eric to, to clarify something. This style of typing for her is not new. She's she's always done it this way, and we all have phases in our life where we type this way. Just sure, thoughts just scattered, and we're lashing out at people. And I, if you sat her down and said, "Hey, Brittany, do you think that post was right?" A part of her might go, "No," but it's just I had to. I, I was bottling it up. Sure, sure. I don't, again, thirteen years of bottling things up. You just and. Uh, but she's always typed this way. That's the point I'm trying to make is that she's still stuck in that teenage way of expressing herself. I think this conservatorship severely compromised her development. Let's go to the audio clip. Uh, I'm really excited for this. I have a lot of notes uh, and yeah, let's just jump right in. And I have a lot of legal questions in this as well. And uh, yeah, let's, 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 let's go. <laughs> I'm here, <clears throat> honestly, just, to open myself to others and try to shed a light on if anyone out there has ever gone through hardships or whatever it is, just to put a light on it. And so that person doesn't feel alone because I really know what that feels like. Okay, I'm gonna go first. I'm just gonna rewind just a little bit so we could sure. see the, the script up there. What is happening? Why don't we see it? Oh, here, sorry. Mm -hmm. What is happening? What? I do think I'm in a place. No, what is happening? Why can't I go back? Oh, that's the volume. I'm such a bozo. <laughs> I was, I was, I was doing the volume. Nice, Left arrow. Left uh, okay. arrow. So first, uh, uh, so this is what we call the mission statement. So you know, every company, every organization has a mission statement, which is like, this is why we exist. This is why we do what we do. This is Brittany's mission statement. This is why I'm making this video. Um, first, open myself. This is a concept we're going to hear a lot. Openness, opening, opening up. And uh, I think it's, it, it's very important to her. And this is a lot of the reason we're seeing these Instagram posts of her just finally being allowed to open up. I think that's a massive priority for her, just being open. I think honesty is more important for her than image at this point. We're going to get a lot of clues about that later in the audio that I'm excited for you guys to hear. Um, 
let's talk about hardships or whatever it is just to put a light on it. And so that person doesn't feel alone. There's a lot in there. First of all, that person. Typically with things like this, we talk to ambiguous groups, anyone out there, people out there. That person is so specific. She, there's a part of her here going, if you're going through anything like this, hardships or whatever it is. Now, in a lot of cases, we look at whatever as a dismissive thing, hardships or whatever it is. In this case, it's, I think she even lacks the word to describe what the hell she went through. And she's going, if there's anyone out there even going through whatever it is, whatever the hell this thing is, that person, I want, I want to put a light on that. I want to be able to put a light on that. Now, here's where the irony of this whole thing comes in. She says that's her goal. And then the next 20 minutes are her retelling her story. So there's very little of her actually putting a light on how to deal with something like this. And I find that interesting. I find that there's, it's interesting that there's a discrepancy between her mission statement and what the message is. This is a very big clue that even she doesn't know where she's going with this. And that's comforting. We're going to get honesty here. It means she grabbed her recording device and she just went off. And we're going to get a lot more clues about this. But when you're saying the goal here is to put a light on it, and then you don't really do that. You tell your story, unless you mean telling your story is putting a light on it. I'm I think I think that's I think sharing my experience yeah. can expose something that if you're going through something similar, I it can I, resonate. I, I, yeah, I, I think she's just saying I, I'm an example. Yeah, um, and that's that's one how it might be. Yeah. To that person. I, I love the use of that person, not this ambiguous thing to that person going through these hardships or whatever it is. And yeah, Eric, I do agree that a part of me wants to say like, that's the light she's putting on it, leading by example of saying like, speak up. This is what you need to do. Um, but she's but still in it. I mean, she's, she's still in it. So she can't really say how to resolve it when she's experiencing it. So, so, so. It's just, and then she goes, because I really know what that feels like. So we're tr there's almost a part of me going like, is that person you? Like, are you trying to help yourself here? Like, and, and, and that's like, are you just still struggling to put a light on this? And again, we're going to get some confused mm. messages later. Of She's even not trying to deal with this. But anyways, the mission statement is noble. If there's someone out there going through this, I want to shed a light on that person. Um, love that. And uh, because I really know what that feels like. And yeah, again, this concept of openness. Um, but I do believe that there's a lot of clues here that even she's not 100% sure. Like, I'm trying to put a light on this. I'm trying to help you. And then she's going to tell her story. She's even not sure where this is headed. Eric, anything to add? Um, only thing that stood out at first is, you know, like this is just standard statement analysis. I'm here honestly. Yeah. What, what, what do you mean honestly? But then I deliberately said, well, let me look at the rest of it. She repeated honestly nine times in the statement. So it's I'm going to say that baseline. honestly is just part of her baseline, baseline. Yeah. and she just keeps saying it. So that, that's the I, only thing. I'm really glad you brought that up because honestly is something we normally pay attention to, but you have to baseline and honestly is very much part of her, her language. Rob, Alita, anything uh, you guys want to throw into that one? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, this to me feels like if, if she's going to go into talking about her experiences, Shining a light on it would imply that, in, according to her, there's been some cloudiness, some darkness as to her experiences. Yep. And mm -hmm. she feels like being able to talk about those and to let other people know about what she's gone through can maybe somehow be helpful to someone else that's going through something that resonates with them there. I, I, absolutely, I, I think it's a sweet way to open this up to say, like, part of the reason I'm doing this is. If someone out there, specific that person, yeah. is going through this, I'm here. Do that. Like you know, let's figure this out. So I love that. And there's going to be bursts of that throughout this speech. That's really heartwarming. Um, let's continue. Rob, you're Rob. You good? Good. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Yeah. I was like, I do think I'm in a place now where I'm a little bit more confident that I can be willing to share openly. Um my thoughts and, uh, and what I've been through because I haven't really had that outlet to share completely openly for so long, just uh, scared of judgments, thoughts of other people and what they think or what they may say. And I think it's crucial for my heart and my head to be able to speak openly about it as if anyone else would. 
I love this one. Um, and it's crazy because when she said, I haven't really had that outlet to share completely openly for so long, I paused and I wrote, she's scared of judgment. And then I pressed play and she goes, uh, scared of judgment. And, and I'll explain why I said that. So this to me, the underlying tone of this is she's skeptical of media because she says elsewhere in the speech that Alita, I like it. Alita's like, yes. Um, <laughs> that was like one of my first thoughts. <laughs> she has said elsewhere that she had opportunities to go on Oprah and all these main platforms. But here she's saying, I didn't want to do that. Instead, I wanted to do this recording on my own platform because here, this way, it can't be manipulated anyway. Mm -hmm. So she goes, uh, where's the thing about outlet? But, but I can be willing to share openly my thoughts and what I've been through because I haven't really had that outlet to share completely openly. Think about that. One of the biggest celebrities in the world is saying she hasn't had that outlet to share completely openly. Britney Spears can call any media source in the world now and they will cancel who's scheduled tomorrow to talk to her. Don't care who it is. So you have had an opportunity to go on those. But will outlets. they convey her message? Exactly. And that's the last yeah. sentence, by the way. What's that? And that's the, um, that's to me the biggest thing in the entire statement is the if at the end. It's very significant point that's crucial. She said, um, be able to speak openly about it as anyone else would, would be a normal statement. But she said, as if anyone else would, as in nobody else will. Wow. If is conditional. Great catch, Eric. High five, buddy. Love it. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, so, so, and I agree with the, the uh, any, as if anybody else would. And I think this anybody else think is also still representing that skepticism of media because she wants to speak as a person, not as Britney Spears, not as a celebrity who thinks that if she goes, the, the lack of opportunity isn't the outlets. The outlets are there. The lack of opportunity is the openly. Again, that word openly, it's so important to her. So think about it. She's saying, I haven't had that opportunity or that um, that's I haven't really had that outlet to share completely openly. You have the outlet, but you don't have the opportunity to share openly. That's the part you don't have. And at the end, she's going uh, as if anybody else would. And, and the if is a great catch, Eric. But for me, the important thing is anybody else. I just want to speak like anybody else. So I'm saying, but it's, it's in there, though. It's, it, like I said, it's, it's kind of mixing two concepts into one statement. Because if you drop the if, it's saying like anybody else would say. Because that's what you would just naturally read. But that if is what triggered me. It's because it didn't belong there. Yeah. I mean, this is this is a woman who has been screwed a million times over by the media, by and, and not just the media, but literally pretty much everyone that you would consider to be the type of people that you should be able to rely on yeah. your family, your spouse, your children. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like like literally every single relationship that 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 we would typically lean on in hard times has been has has faltered for her and so it's almost as if like this is the only outlet that she can possibly trust is direct communication between her and her friend and her followers which is actually true the yeah. only way she could speak directly to the people is to speak directly to the people and, and let's not forget that for 14 years, everything that she wanted to say was filtered through the conservatorship. Yes. If they said, you don't speak, she doesn't speak. Then what happened? She went on the Jonathan Ross show. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. She went on Jonathan Ross in the middle of her conservatorship out in England. And he's a great guy. I've met Jonathan Ross because when I did Penn and Teller Fool Us, he was the host before Alison Hannigan. And he was so sweet. What, he's such a kind guy. So I feel that. They, they, and she connected with him because he's so good at connecting with his guests. It's unbelievable. I saw him with every act on that stage and the way mm -hmm. he connects is, is miraculous. So I bet she felt that there was trust there, that they connected. Now, Jonathan Ross doesn't decide what airs. There's legal teams and producers and editors. He, he, sure. just, he hosts. So at the end of the day, she talked about the conservatorship and there was someone in the audience who leaked what she was saying, but it never aired. So... She's scared. She's scared that when she does speak up, it doesn't end up airing. Uh, and, and can you imagine that? Can you imagine like having one opportunity to speak your mind and then it doesn't even air and you're like, it would, it would drive me nuts. So, so this is huge. I think the main takeaway from this paragraph is skepticism of media. So again, it's about taking control. I am going to speak my words my way.
nobody's going to edit this. Hey, uh, somebody in the chat was pointing out over analyzing. I think the if in the last statements is just her fumbling. I'll tell you a secret about statement analysis. It's a hundred percent over analyzing. Yeah, it's, it's over analyzing nice. every oh, piece too. of punctuation. <laughs> You're analyzing a pronoun. Why are they saying I here? Yeah. Why did they not put I in there? Because it's all significant. When we are saying things, we're making it flow without thinking. So subconscious kind of leaks through. Uh, yeah, it's it's what we do. We offer uh, speculations based on other times where this has happened. It could be nothing, but mm -hmm. but that's that's why people come here for us to. Uh, to break down these things. So I'm with you, Eric, 100%. Uh, one more point, though, that I just thought of. Good. She is in a different place now in 2022 with her Instagram where she could drop audio and immediately get to all of her fans, which she could not be doing in 2007, 2008. Right. Everything was filtered through the press and things like that. So in, in, a, in an odd way, it's kind of a better time for her where she has the possibility of actually directly speaking more. Ooh, Eric, let me push back on that one. I've been, I've been listening and I, I have been listening to the statements themselves. This is, we talked about a pause button when, when that, when her rights were basically stinted, even before mm -hmm. the conservatorship, she, she was given both a restriction and a hall pass a restriction in that she could not control what she did or did not say a hall pass in that she wasn't held accountable for things mm. because she wasn't actually saying the things she was never forced to develop agency. She was never forced yes. to develop and learn mm -hmm. consequences from her own behaviors. Mm -hmm. So that was on pause for 14 years. And when I say consequences of your own behaviors, I'm not talking about all the stuff that they did to her. I'm talking about mm -hmm. if I take my hand and I put it on a stove and it burns me, that is my action. It caused the burn on my hand. If I go out in public and I yell at somebody and I say, hey, hit me in the face and they hit me in the face, I have learned something that my ver my words that I speak out have a response. And they have a reaction. Mm -hmm. All of this pause button occurred during her developmental stage where she's she's kind of coming back into this, where she now has every every right, every entitlement that comes with being of her age with the agency of a teenager from when it was taken from her. Yeah. So she goes out on blast and says everything out That's and, a good she, point. and she gets it coming straight back at her full force. That's what I so mean. it's like, she's experimenting with, I have this power to say things. And now that mm. she's saying them, just like what we were seeing with the Instagram post, that was a teenager fighting with a teenager. Yeah. Sure. That's what it was. Sure. And, I mean, and why is Rob so good at everything? I don't just I don't disagree with you, Rob. I was just saying though that she does yeah. have she has more of an opportunity to do it now. If she came out of her conservatorship in two thousand five, she wouldn't have this direct pipeline like she correct. Does. Yes, yeah, so correct. that's all. Yep. Eric, yeah. Eric, I'm gonna take something Rob is saying and I'm gonna adjust. So earlier I said I agree that that if is out of place. So and, and again, I, I can't overemphasize this. Our community here is the fifth panel member. I do keep an eye on the chat because what mm -hmm. you're all saying is very important. And we're gonna get to the super chats, everyone. Remember that at the end of the uh, at the end of the video. Uh, so I'm not ignoring them. We will get to them. If you have anything really important you want to say, pop it in there. Um, but Eric, I will say this. Somebody in the comments said, is baseline being considered? We do have to consider the fact that mm -hmm. in this audio and often when she speaks, things are out of order. She says things that don't belong there. Uh, words are jumbled up a little. So yeah, it's possible. Sure. Eric is just offering a possible reason for that if to be there. Could it be wrong? Yeah, everything we say could, could be wrong. <laughs> We're saying you know, it's, it's a very specific thing that is very specifically wrong. Like, remember, what was the first thing I said? Oh, honestly stuck out at me. And then I did a count and I said, oh, she did it nine times. So it's irrelevant. It's a baseline. So I didn't just come up with it as um, uh, it, it is something that distinctly does stand out. And if we go through all of it, I haven't seen that kind of a, You're right. a, a, a you know, trick in there. Like another thing that stood out was just weird is I swear when I listen to the audio, she says swap team. It's a she says swap team both times. Says swap yes, team. It, it's a P. I it's swear it's a P. Twice. And I deliberately, yeah. I even looked it up. Yeah. I'm like, I think she means SWAT, but I and mm -hmm. I did go look it up to make sure because it was gurneys and drugs. I was like, is there some sort of drug rehab procedure or some sort of mental health thing that would involve it? But 
I don't know. It's just it was an odd thing, but yeah. she does it herself. I don't know yeah. why. Yeah. So she does misspeak, and uh, but yeah, I do. I do find personally that that if as if anyone else would. Uh, as if is speculative. So, so that that can mean that, and 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 it, it's in line with what we're saying. I think she's just skeptical of a lot of things. There's this me against the world mentality here, um, and that's why she's standing up for the underdog. So, yeah, let's keep going. My first job after the two weeks of being hospitalized and <laughs> completely traumatized out of my mind. Um, so Rob, did you hear that one? That to me was more of a... That one sounded like a sneeze. Sounded like a laugh. Oh, did it? Wow. Okay. We have three different things. Really? Here. Yeah. Play it again. You have sneeze. You have laugh. I have more of like a... Because it's coming from the... From the back. Laugh usually comes from the... This way. This was more from the back here. The... You know that? I mean, I just play it. Mm -hmm. First job after the two weeks of being hospitalized and... Completely traumatized out of my mind. Oh, sneeze, maybe. I don't think it's a sneeze. Eric, what do you got? Sadness, happiness? Or I'm going to go with Rob's laugh. Laugh. Sar yeah. Like a sarcastic, sarcastic. Like, like, <laughs> like a sarcastic, like, like, yeah, I was freaking <laughs> traumatized. Ugh. Wow. As if. Okay. Hmm. okay. Kind of like a, a disgust laugh. If it... It's like, uh, it's like Schrodinger's sneeze. <laughs> After the two weeks of being hospitalized and completely traumatized out of my mind as i picture her face doing that it's more scrunched than smiley like i said it's a disgust laugh though i mean it's not like a like a contemptuous like, laugh okay. can yeah, you believe that's, a, yeah, that's a, i was trying to like sarcastic mm. contemptuous something like that like okay, uh, okay. are you effing kidding of course i was got it um i did a tv show called how i met your mother and then i started working on an album um, called Circus um, and started working away right away and I went along with it because I was scared I was scared and fearful I didn't even really do anything and I had like a swap team and how like none of it made sense to me since that day I did probably four and a half tours I did an album Circus um, Femme Fatale Britney Jean and Glory and then I started doing a um, Vegas show in uh, Las Vegas and I did that for four and a half years it so, sounds to me like the audio was spliced together thank you with I was going to say something happened between the two since starting with since that day I probably did I, that, I did wasn't probably four that, was, that wasn't me that was so yeah. all so to be clear all these clips are extracted from the full audio and I didn't do any splicing within them myself yeah I um, actually I do have I, I have missing parts because I was putting parts in Spidey so let me see where uh, she did circus um, and started working right away. Then this was missing. All I do remember is I had to do what I was told. Um, I was told I was fat every day. I had yeah. to go to the gym. I had to just. Um, so the reason the reason I'd never remember so feeling Eric, so demoralized. But no. was that is that where the Alita sends the cut? No, since, no, that the, the cut was day, again is, is later. Where I the cut. So, yeah, so what I'm like, saying is, I, that that part where you hear those little pops and cuts, I didn't do that. I I did remove that sentence, Eric, because I organized this in a way where there, it's topical, and we're going to uh -huh. talk about all the things she was felt and made to do in a later clip because there was something else I wanted to focus on in this clip. Okay, well, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Just... yeah, we should have we should have talked about it. So I did remove that that part where she said what she was made to do and all things she was forced to because we're going to talk about that. She, she circles back to that, but there's something else happening in this clip that's so important. Before I talk about that, um, Emily D. Baker said that she feels it was like she's laughing at the ridiculousness of the situation, and uh, Emily wins. We, 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 in Emily, we scoff trust. Scoff laugh. Uh, somebody wrote scoff laugh. I thought that was a perfect way to describe okay. it. In Emily, yeah. we trust. Be, yeah. Emily was very attached to this case. She was, she was present for some of it. So, um, and Emily... I hope you understand you're coming on the channel to talk about it. Like, I hope you've just accepted that faith. Um, there's a few things here that are very important to me. Uh, this clip was here for a very specific reason for me, for two specific reasons. The first is my biggest problem with this entire thing. My biggest problem with this entire conservatorship is this. It was a drastic measure that changed nothing. If you're going to say, no, my daughter needs a break. This life is killing her. 
We're going to hit the pause button. She's not going to tour. She's not going to do TV shows. She's not going to do Vegas shows. She needs to be away from all this. There's a part of me that would say, you want to do that for a year because you're concerned for your daughter, fine. But the same thing that caused her to have this mental breakdown is continuing to happen. She's still doing the TV shows. She's still doing the records. She's still doing Vegas. So you're continuing the behavior. You're just taking control of where the assets go. That I think till today is my biggest problem with this whole thing. Dance monkey dance. Dance monkey yeah. dance. But yeah. don't but still dance the same way you were dancing, but now you dance for me. I hate and now that. and now dad takes more of a paycheck than you do. Exactly. From what you earn. Um, there, there's a very interesting choice of words here that I want to talk about. She uses it twice. A TV show called How I Met Your Mother, an album called Circus. Go listen to any celebrity, singer, actor on any talk show ever. They don't use that terminology. They don't say I was on a TV show called How I Met Your Mother. They say that's when I was on How I Met Your Mother. That's when I recorded Circus. This is the way they speak because it makes it seem like these projects that they were on, this album that they're on, everyone knows what it is. And everyone does know. You don't need to say an album called Circus. If you say that's when I recorded Circus, we all know what Circus is. It was massively successful. How I Met Your Mother is one of the most popular sitcoms ever filmed. It's been nominated for a ton of Emmys. You don't need to say a TV show called How I Met Your Mother and no celebrities speak this way. Even lesser celebrities with lesser known projects will say it like I was working on circus. I was working on X, Y, Z. Uh, I recorded this. I was you on know, this show. Spidey, I actually could see her saying that on a t about a TV show, but not her album. And the yeah. reason why I say it is that she goes around the world and she does interviews. Yep. And England doesn't necessarily know about how I met your mother. I don't know. Maybe they do, Nothing. but it, it but it's possible. It's like that a global success. Okay, well, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know theory. about that. But all I'm saying is, Eric, even celebrities who know the audience isn't sure what they're talking about, they'll still say, oh, that's the time I was working on XYZ because it makes their projects seem bigger and more international. When you say, so when I, I'll take myself as an example. In Rob's got to push back. That's fine. I don't care. Um, <laughs> I have some thoughts. <laughs> yeah. when, when, I tell people, when I tell people about my television creds, for example, I'll hmm. say something like, I made an appearance on the Today Show. I don't think I've ever had to say a, a program called the TV show. But when I talk about Wizard Wars, for example, which I did before that, I'll say I was on a TV show called Wizard Wars. I, I call it because I feel like not everyone might know what that is. So, Or you might say I was on Penn and Teller. Wizard works. Wizard works. Even more to, because they're a higher status than the show. Context. Rob, what's Rob? What's the issue? Hit me with it, baby. My my pushback on this one is: doesn't this kind of give you a hint as to who her target audience of this audio might be? It, it like she she's not saying she's not relaying this audio for her fans. Her right. fans would know these things. She's relaying this audio for I, everyone else. I don't I, know. I, I think that I think that this just shows how isolated she is. That she exactly. doesn't know what Thank people you, know. Yeah. Top of the class. You know what? You know what? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the No, no, no. Bring him back. Bring him back. No, I mean this just this just shows like she doesn't know how familiar people will be with something like how I met your mother or circus or you know, like because this is this is how this is how you know like like we'll you know when I'm describing a legal concept that I'm not sure if the audience knows, I'll say like, this is something called X, Y, Z, you know, like, as opposed to just assuming that people know, I, I think that, I think that she just, she has been in this isolated bubble for so long that she, she's, she's not, she doesn't know how big of a deal it is to be on how I met your mother. She doesn't know how many people exactly. absolutely love and adore that show. Exactly. She she's hasn't been so living in our world, but she does know that about circus. She no, no. No, 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 that's why I said I understand the TV show, especially, you know, and he said she's too damn busy to watch TV. She probably barely knows what is on TV or popular or whatever. And also speaking to the world. But she does know that Circus sold really well. She does know that. Uh, that one, I'm going to say, she, yeah, she probably knows that her it's, album. It's just, to me, I'm, I'm so on board with what Alita is saying. Again, please go listen to any celebrity talking about any project on any late night talk show. And it's never, I did a movie called this. It's, I worked on this. I did that. 
we it's it's grandizing. It's like everyone knows mm -hmm. this. This is my this is what I do. Even lesser known artists with lesser known albums, they don't say cult. It minimizes the importance and impact of what it is. I think it's just it's it's a mix of humility and just being so detached from what the audience knows and who knows what. I think she's just detached from what is being conveyed to the to the public. What do they know? Does everyone know how successful Circus was? So she feels the need to say an album called Circus. We know what Circus is. Everyone knows what Circus is. That's my take on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Now, the split Alita heard, and I definitely heard too, I was going to bring it up, is none of it made sense to me, period. And then it actually sounded to me like she stopped recording at that time and then came back to it and started saying, since that day, like maybe she had listened to it and, and continued her thought or she paused to go do something else and then came to it because the environment changed. The background kind of changed. And if you listen, you can hear like the, the, the stop and the start and it sounds like a different surroundings, if that makes sense. Here's an interesting perspective. Um, and, and I do like this quite a bit. Uh, so Delta Tango says if they say called in an interview, they are being sarcastic. And I've definitely seen that as well. Like you'll see like maybe Robert Downey Jr. off the top of my head. I'm not quoting him, but you might say something like, oh, I, I was working on a little movie. You may have heard of it. It's called The Avengers. You know, like almost like sarcastically. And oh, I yeah, yeah, yeah. To, yeah. Um, but, but but I don't think almost that's a humble brag. Yeah, humble brag. It's absolutely. I don't I'm not. I don't think that's what it is here. I think no. I think it's just she's detached from what people know and what people's experiences are. That's my take on this. We're, before we look at the next clip, I want to preface it by asking you to listen for something specific. Um, listen to the shifts in her voice when she's talking about what the backup dancers were doing, so how they were having fun in Vegas, and notice the shift in her voice both times when she shifts from that to what she was doing. It's for lack of better words, crazy how. Oh, where's it? Oh, Lita. I was going to say, we she had, to, she had to refresh her screen. The... <laughs> we had to, had to refresh. Oh, she put it in the chat. Okay. So, so please listen for that. Notice the first time where it goes from bubbly to just dark. And then the second time it goes from bubbly to sad. And you see that shift the moment she goes from talking about the dancers to herself. I do remember working and I got to a point where, you know, because my pride in my 30s, I have to live under my father's rules and, you know, the dancers are playing and drinking and having fun at nights in Vegas and I couldn't do anything. And I remember just being like, my performances I know were horrible. Like I even wore wigs and all the dancers were doing all these nice, sexy head flip turns and I had conditioner treatment in my hair and like these little um, caps over my head and just during a whole show getting conditioner treatments just with wigs on because I was just like a robot. Honestly, I just, I didn't give a f anymore because I couldn't go where I wanted to go. I couldn't have the nannies that I wanted to have. I couldn't have cash. Um, Did you notice that? Oh, yeah. How the dancers, it was this high bubbly tone. They were having fun, they were doing this and I couldn't do anything. And it goes down you into know, that. I know, you know, I know. That's been like, it's like for emphasis. Exactly. And then this dark, and then she goes back to the dancers. And then, now, and then when she goes back to the conditioner and the thing, I am feeling her pain so much. Now, disclaimer, I have a very, very good friend who in the Vegas tour was her main backup dancer. The one who's on her left, close to her at all times. Very good friend of mine. I've heard these stories of how much, and, and I've heard such great things about Brittany and how kind she was to all of them and so sweet and so nice, but all these things about, and I, I don't want to put words in her mouth. I don't want to speak for her at all. So I'm going now back to what Brittany said here. We hear it in her tonality, how they were allowed to do all these things, freedom. It's so it's, it's, it's calm and it's bubbly and it's this high pitch and it's fun. You can almost hear the smile, but the moment she shifts to what was happening with her, it's grim and it's sad and it's slow. That's all I had on that. But I really wanted you to all Gilded hear cage. What's that? She's in a gilded cage. Yeah. And yeah. I wanted you all to hear that heartbreaking shift. It's yeah. not, it, 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 I can't even see her. I can't even imagine what her body language would be on this. I, I, I don't imagine I would be, it's my specialty, right? To see it in the body language, facial expressions. I can't imagine um, I would have an easy time watching that. We see that she, shift. 
heartbreaking. She also seemed to like particularly languish over conditioner treatment in my hair in the middle of the yep. paragraph. Like there was something about that that was like particularly painful for her. I'm going to guess this is my pure projection. But remember, this is after she shaved her head and that whole incident. And I could see that they might have really been on her case. Like, now we've got to yep. do this with your hair. We've got to do these yeah. rigs. We've got to put stuff in there because of what you did to your hair. And I just have a feeling that there is a, a, a contention there. I agree with you, Alita, I, but I think it's quite literally yeah. probably was painful with the wigs and the sweatiness and whatever else, weaves. I, I don't know. Obviously, and it was, it was creatively it was, limiting. It wasn't sure. just that. I mean, she she had the hair was an issue. And this kind of gives an illustration to why she did the shaving, maybe the agency element. Like she, yeah. they controlled everything about it. The hair was this beautiful thing and she took it away. She controlled it. She took it back. And even that although, effort although that of been trying to line, take it back. Although the timeline I mean, was that would have been before this, but Rob, I agree with you hundred percent. I think her hair is a symbol of her freedom and, and even just shaving it is going and this and Rob, the twisted thing to think about is what if the relationship you're seeing is reversed? So they know that in 2007, she shaved her head as a symbol of her freedom. And now they're going, oh, we know how to keep her in line. Go for the hair. That's what that was kind of what I was I'm kind sorry, of I'm feeling. Sorry. No, that, that, no, you're, you're hitting it right on. That was the point. They, they yeah. are using it. And it, of course, it hurts her that much more because she's now in this at this stage, she's realizing and reflecting on how they use that tool. And it hurts doubly for her, not just that in that moment this sucked for her, but now knowing that it was being used as a tool. Yeah. It was like the one thing she she seemingly had left is like what it seems like. And even yeah. that is is then just flipped on its head. Exactly. Used right, they rubbed her. her. That's what I'm saying. They rubbed her nose in it. And, and this also kind of goes back to, I mean, the earlier part in the paragraph too, also kind of goes back to what, you know, what you guys were saying earlier about the arrested development aspect, right? Because this is, she's talking about, you know, the pride, it, it causing, ca it, cause of my pride in, in my thirties, I have to live under my father's rules and you know, the dancers are playing and, and it's just, you know, people often say like, like the, the different, um, like decades that we go through your twenties tend to be very confusing. You're trying to figure out who you are, what you're going to be for the rest of your life. And you're like, you don't really know necessarily what you stand for or, you know, or who you're going to be in your thirties. It's like, I don't know if this is also for men, but I feel like for, for women, it's particularly true. Like you start to feel like, okay, I know who I am. I know what I want to do. I know, I know how I want to go about things. And that's just been completely taken away from her through this whole process and just like I, I just I, there was something about her talking about being in her 30s and having to live under her father's rules that just like that that stuck with me even though it's like not any different than what we've been talking about yep what about the last sentence which is kind of odd i'm just trying to figure it out i couldn't have the nannies that i wanted to have are these nannies for her children or, yeah, or, I, you know, I, 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 it's just kind of odd i i it doesn't it's, it's, uh, there's it's, something there. That sentence know. fell out of place for me a little bit too. Nanny's, yeah, is it for her kids? Because by this point, I'm pretty sure uh, the her ex husband had most. Well, of I think 50 percent custody until 2013 or. Say that again. I think he had 50 percent custody for a long time, and then that changed, like a few years back. Or what was yeah, it? 2017. It's hard to know, it's or hard to know which right. period she's talking about right now because Vegas was a few years back. So that's why I didn't want to really speculate on that because i don't know what nanny she's talking about uh, yeah i didn't know if it's been there we go on um, nz butterfly girl that's the thing it's like is it nannies are watching out for her or her kids yeah. it, it's yeah. th such an odd and I, I wanted to have i couldn't have cash well that's all freedom oriented yeah but um anyway it just i i don't know enough to make sense of that yeah yeah me too that that sounds felt uh for the people asking in the chat i will leave a link to the full audio in the in the description so you guys can go listen to the whole thing again i've selected clips where the analysis of the statements are telling um okay this next part i'm gonna have a lot of questions for lita and rob on this next clip and i want you to all listen to anybody who's ever been heavily manipulated or gaslighted by someone um listen to the language in this next little bit when she's talking about 
what her, so I'm gonna give you a bit of context before we listen to it. During a dance rehearsal, she refused to do a specific dance move. There was a specific dance move they told her to do. She said, no, I don't wanna do that dance move. And this is what her father said to her in response to that. Cash. Um... Yeah, here we go. And I remember his last words were, now, you don't have to go, but if you don't go, we're going to go, go to court and there'll be a big trial and you're going to lose. I have way more people on my side than you. You don't even have a lawyer. So they even, uh, don't even think about it. Uh, so I did it. I went to the place. I was scared out of my mind. And none of it, again, made any sense of what they were doing to me. And again, I, I haven't wanted to share this because it's unbelievably offensive, sad, abusive. And honestly, would anybody believe me? Uh. So, but yeah, Ugh, Ugh is very right. So before we pass it on, Rob, do you have your unicorn, buddy? <laughs> yeah, he's back there. Always. Okay right now, always. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so before I pass it on to the lawyers, this is, this is a place where I feel she has quite a bit of clarity in the, in the scattered brain sort of reasoning where she's going back and forth. Like for her to be able to say, like, and honestly, would anybody believe me? The fact that she was able to reason that out where there's a certain narrative being presented is, is actually proof of quite effective reasoning. That there's a fear there of her speaking up, but maybe nobody's going to believe me. But it's also the result of heavy gaslighting. The words that I'm reading in this, if I used to practice hypnotherapy, a lot of you know this, there are words in this paragraph that we just looked at that if I heard in a therapy session, my next move would be to call the cops to look into this. Because Rob and Alita, why don't you guys, I don't know who wants to tackle this first, but first of all, you know what, let me give you the signs here and then Rob and Alita, we'll jump to you. So first there's a threat. You don't have to go, but if you don't, this is going to happen. And that threat to me is a very big, exaggerated, unrealistic threat because you refuse to do a dance move. That's not, I don't know for a fact, this is why I need to hear from Robin Alita that her not doing a dance move is a breach of the conservatorship. I don't think that that's the way that works at all. More on this in a second. You're going to lose. This is something manipulators use. I have a video on the channel. I'll leave a link in the description to tactics that manipulators use and how to counter them. And you're going to lose. That's an opinion. That's not a fact. Gaslighters present opinion as fact. He doesn't know she's going to lose. I think, and again, maybe I'll be corrected, that it's a far cry to say you're going to lose because you don't want to do a specific dance move. Come on. No way. Third, I have a lot more people on my side than you do. This is called ambiguous social proof. And manipulators use this all the time. Everyone says how you've been acting up. Everyone knows how crazy you are. So enacting the fact that there's more people on my side than yours is a heavily manipulative thing to say to someone. Now, did he for sure say these things or is she just sort of that's the way she interpreted it? I don't know. But for her to remember these specific things and that's how she felt. And would anybody believe me? At least some of this, in my opinion, must be true. Robin Alita, my question to you is this. Brittany doesn't want to do a dance move. Her dad brings her to court for that. Is she going to lose that? I mean, it seems like it's just, a, it's a, it's a lot. It's like much do about nothing really is, is how I would feel about it. You know, it's, it's a lot of court expense. I I'm, I'm just, I'm imagining being the lawyer, bringing this issue up to the judge and being like, your honor, <laughs> uh, this is what we're trying to compel. Um, and, and just having the judge just look at me over his or her glasses and being like, are you kidding me? Um, but I, I mean, there could yeah. be, there could be specific terms. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. Alita, Alita, just, Alita, Alita, come straight to the point. The point is, I know that we're trying to be cautious here about the legal yeah. analysis part of it. Um, I'm just going to be pretty candid. No, a, a conservatorship can't force you to do, they can't force you to, to engage in an activity in a certain fashion. They can force you to be at a place. They can force you to submit to testing. They can force you to take eat food, to take medicine. They can force you via intravenous uh, delivery system of certain medications or food or water. They can force you to do things to keep you alive. 
to keep you acting and behaving. Yeah. Can a conservator and can a judge say, Britney Spears, you have to, you can't turn left at the end of the runway. You can turn right. No. no. Yeah. Especially thinking about it particularly because it's like, you know, you can look at it very narrowly, but you can also sort of like pull back the scope a little bit and say, this is her work, which means this would be compelled work. Compelled can't do it. Servitude. Cannot do it. There's a certain, there's a certain amendment against that. <laughs> just a bit. Just a bit. It, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, to clarify in the chat. To clarify in the chat. So, so they said you had to do a dance move. She said no, and their response was, "You're gonna go because you're resisting. You're gonna go to a a, a therapy or a center." So that's why this starts by saying you don't have to go, because uh, a lot of people are saying it doesn't sound like it's about a dance move. You're right. It's you're gonna do this dance move. She goes, "I'm not doing that dance move." And they started this entire big thing about her not doing this dance move. Oh, it's time to go back to the, 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 the help facility. You need help, you know, resistance. And, and we're going to talk some more about that again because she's going to so talk about the dance move. I have, to, I have to address the chat on a couple things here. I know that they forced her. Stop talking to us like radiants. I know that they forced her. I know they, they made her do these things. I know that she was required to do these things. I know that there was recordings. I know there was behaviors. I know there's intimidation. I'm talking about did they legally have authority? If they had appeared in front of a judge, would a judge have backed them and said they have to do the dance move this way? I know that they manipulated the F out of her. And that's why Spidey got so upset when he heard what was being said. Because what's being said is the indication that she was being forced via manipulation by a manipulation and control by an overarching individual and group of individuals that made her feel compelled to do it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so whether, and you know what, it doesn't make a difference whether you have to go, whether you have to do, whether you have to, whether you have to dance this amount of, no, you don't have to go, but if you don't go threat, ambiguous social proof, I have so much more people on my side than you, you will lose. Come on now, come on now. It's funny you're saying manipulation or gaslighting. I just think of it as a straight bullying, because I, you know, I think of it as a straightforward bullying. Because yeah. the gaslighting usually is a, oh, but I'm here for you, and then I slip something in. Oh, but I'm here for you, and this slips. This to me just feels like a straight out. No, you're gonna do it, because if you don't do it, your ass is gonna be in court. Da 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 da. There's not a lot of, you know, the gaslight, which is you know. Love, hey, love, hey, you know, I don't know. That, that maybe it's just me. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. Um, this next part is maybe my favorite in terms of what, what it indicates. The main thing I, I, to this day, I kind of stopped believing in God at that time because I didn't know how they could have 40 people leave my house a day and me work from eight to six at night be seen changed every time I changed in the shower. No privacy, no door, nothing. How did they get away with it? And what the f did I do to deserve that? I couldn't even smoke cigarettes. People on death row can smoke cigarettes. So let me tell you why this paragraph is here and what it tells me. Um, this is what I was referring to earlier. There is zero, zero, zero image management here. She doesn't care what people think of her or how she's perceived. She has a message to give. Why do I know that? A few reasons. First, she is openly admitting of her doubt in God. Now, she knows that her fans, like she's an all-American girl. You know, she has a lot of country fans. She knows that when you say something like that, a lot of your fans it's going to polarize them. It's going to offend them that you doubted your faith in God. She has a lot of faithful followers. So by saying something like that, just outright, she's going, I don't care what anyone thinks about my doubt of my faith. Then smoking cigarettes. We all agree that this is an image problem. You know, a lot of celebrities have to smoke in secret, especially her. She has young fans. She was a teen celebrity. So it taints her image a little to openly talk about wanting to smoke. She doesn't care. Then we have that hard F-bomb. There's a couple of F-bombs in this, but this one was a what the f and she just lays it on there. Um, so these are three signs that it's so much more important for her to get her message out and speak her heart than managing the perception that people have of her. I think there's one more thing too. This answers a lot of um, 
action she's taking now. Being mm -hmm. seen every time I change in the shower. No privacy, no door, nothing. Everybody is commenting, and it's noticeable that she likes to take her clothes off all the time now on mm -hmm. Instagram. But that is almost like the hair. It's like taking control of, yeah. I will get naked and do what I want when I yeah. want to do this. 100%. The, I it's own the big, my body. It's, it's, it's the big old F you to everybody that was that allowed her to be in this position. Yeah. It's control. It's, it, and it's, it, it, good for her. I, I, I don't know what it is with me and Rob. Like I have this tendency of like, I think we get the same thoughts at the same time. So try I just, to, just try to, I'm, Rob, I'm so sorry. I want to publicly apologize for all the times I've cut you off. I, and we all do it to each other. It's a good sign that it's vibing. I apologize. But Rob, please finish what you're saying. Oh, no. I, I say I, I do the exact same to you like all the time because honestly, we're reaching a certain point and we kind of boil over at the same time. It's like something is said and we bottle it and we're like, I'm not going to say, not going to say, not going to say. And we both hit that break point like right at the same time. It's like, I have to. And we're like saying the same exact words. So we, just, right. we just have to harmonize better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we Simon and Garfunkel this thing. Um, so I totally agree with, with everything Rob said. And, uh, again, it's her going, yeah, you want to creep in on me when I'm taking a shower? Well, here, have a good look. You know, like everyone, you take this where you want, take a look. So again, it, it's hard to understand what's going on in your head for 13 years when your own, you feel like your own body wasn't your own. I can't imagine. It's horrible. Plus you're being told if you step out of line and we're going to talk about this in a second, you step out of line, you go to therapy. It's it. Yeah. Let's move on, shall we? Mm -hmm. I missed my AA meetings, although I was kind of forced to go to AA and I'm not even an alcoholic. I actually enjoyed it because I thought the people were brilliant. They shared their stories just to share their story um, and in a circle of women and men who just are trying to be better people. So that, when I heard that, I actually had to pause and go take a break because that was the part of this whole interview that said to me, they destroyed a sweetheart. Like, yeah, she had problems. She had mental issues. She uh, maybe, I don't know, she, they say she was using substances. She said she wasn't really. She, she clearly had things that needed work. But how many people do you know that would be forced to go to Alcoholics Anonymous when they feel they don't belong there? You could maybe argue, maybe she didn't. She said, I don't care. She feels she doesn't. And instead of saying, I didn't belong there, I shouldn't have been there, she goes, these people were brilliant. And I enjoyed being there. What did she say? I actually enjoyed it because I thought the people were brilliant. They shared their stories. So here we have this celebrity who, you know, most celebrities don't, let's be honest, don't really pay attention to what other people are saying that much. She says she enjoyed being there and listening to other people's stories, even if she felt she didn't belong there. Um, and I think that kind of, that kind of goes back to the first statement that we listened to too, where she says, I'm sharing this to shed a light. It's like, she has that history of, of sharing in AA. She understands the purpose of that. And so that's why she's kind of sharing all of this. This is like a, like a, like an open share in an alcoholics, non anonymous <laughs> meeting. Yeah, no, Alita, you're 100% <laughs> right. I think her mission statement and I, I didn't want to say it back then because I was going to say now and you reminded me, was inspired by Alcoholics Anonymous. The fact that you learn in there that sharing your story is a healing process, I think yeah. that's, and you nailed it, it's the reason in the beginning in her mission statement she said, the reason I'm doing this is to shed light because that's what this is. That's what she learned at Alcoholics Anonymous, sometimes talking about your story. And let's be honest, she goes, they shared their story just to share their story. No, they didn't. That's not why you share your story in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's to find people who relate with your experience, who can help you through it, who can connect. So it, yeah. but she's learning from that, that even for her, just to share her story, just that can be a healing process for herself, yeah. for that person going through this. So Alita, the connection. There's a little bit more to it too, Spidey. Um, What's up? Alcoholics Anonymous, the number one thing that they have to do is sublimate their ego. Yep. Because substance abuse is 100% about ego. Mm -hmm. And this is a rare opportunity for her in all of her surroundings, people in the AA meeting, they are not her employees. 
they don't work for her. They are individual people in a very raw, open, honest place. And there are certain standards that are very important where your ego is at the door. I don't care who the hell you are. And in these meetings, she's meeting people who are expressing themselves and being as honest as they can and as truthful and open as they can with her. And that would be unusual compared to the whirlwind of the people around her, in my opinion. Yes. Agreed. And let's all thank Moonlight for joining us today because I think that is dead on. Yeah. I think that, that the fact that she didn't know who she could talk to, she could open up to, but here she's in a room full of people telling their own stories, their own hardships. She felt a sense of belonging, even in a group that she didn't feel she belonged to because of the main reason that they're there, which is the alcoholism, which she didn't feel merited her presence. The human connection is something she appreciated. Moonlight, thank you so much. And it, and it involves a certain sense of trust to be able to talk about some of the, the, the most, the most, vulnerable things that you are going through that you have done to other people that you know that you are sort of struggling with and that involves a lot of trust which of course she has every reason to not trust really anyone because of her experiences yeah. and let's be honest she didn't have to say this she's going on a 20 minute thing she's choosing everything she says she's choosing to say she wanted to smoke cigarettes she's choosing to drop f-bombs left right and center she didn't have to do this there's nobody asked her nobody asked her and this is Eric, we were talking about earlier the disadvantage of there not being questions. The one advantage of there not being questions is the speaker is telling us what's important for them. Nobody asked her, how did it feel like to be in a meetings? And she's going, oh, well, you know, it was really nice and trying to make the best out of it. She chose mm. to say this. Sure. Um, okay. Next. Better people. But the whole thing that made it really confusing for me is these people are on the street fighting for me, but my sister and my mother aren't doing anything. Um, to me, it was like they secretly, honestly liked me being the bad one, like I was messed up, and they kind of just liked it that way. Otherwise, why weren't they outside my doorstep saying, baby girl, get in the car, let's go? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's heartbreaking. And um, she did continue beyond that. I didn't know if you cut it off or if that was just not there. Um, I, I wanted to end on the most important thing she said there purposely. Okay. Uh, baby girl, get in the car. Let's go. To me, I think that I wanted that there because it's betrayal of the worst kind when she it's not, and she's more upset at her mom and her sister more than her dad. Because that's who she feels betrayed her. Yeah. And baby girl, get in the car, let's go. Destroyed me. Because it's not, she feels let down by someone who she feels she is the baby girl of. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. like, well, like, and she, I, she extrapolated on it further, saying that almost five, almost half a year, you know, and the only response we didn't know. That, to me, really compounds it a lot. Say that again? Say that again? I mean, when she continues, she did go into that, and I feel like it does actually add to it. I think that's the main thing that hurt me. Um, um, I couldn't process how my family went along with it for so long. I mean, almost five, almost half a year, you know? Um, and their only response was, we didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, and, and I get baby girl as part of her vernacular. It's the way, again, it goes back to what we were saying earlier about like in the South, that's sort of those endearing terms. But like, oh, sure. it's not like she's not like there. That connection between her and her mom is still there, even in her most betrayed moment. Mm -hmm. You know, like she's not saying, you know, why didn't they come and get me and say, let's go, let's get in the car. Brittany, like baby girl, get in the car. Like this is the relationship she wanted. This is the protection she wanted. This is what she feel was betrayed. Hmm. Anything to add, anyone? Yeah, it's no. just the, the juxtaposition between strangers on the street, <laughs> you know, and and her her close family. Again, it goes back to like like who she who she feels like she should be able to lean on yeah. and to trust, and and that's just or been AA, completely or people in an AA meeting versus her entourage. Yeah. 
people in the street, people at AA meetings I connected with more than the people who are, who are supposed to be saying, baby girl, get in the car, let's go. Like yeah. she's still in her head, baby girl. It, 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 this one, this one wrecked me. Yeah. Um, okay. Before we listen to this next one, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to present a uh, bit of a, bit of a challenge, not a challenge, a little thing to listen for. In this next clip, there's a sentence or there's a couple of words that fall right out. They don't belong there. In the string of thought that she's having, in, in what she's saying, in the message she's trying to portray, there's a couple of words that just do not belong there. So I'm asking, you know, Rob, Alita, Eric, you're more than welcome to join in. But the chat, can you catch the words that don't belong? Here we go. Car, let's go. How much effort and work and heart I put in to what I did when I did work, even down to the details of how many rhinestones are going to be in my costume. And I cared so much. And they literally killed me. They threw me away. That's what I, f I felt like my family threw me away. I was performing for like thousands of people at night in Vegas, the rush of being a performer, the laughter, the joy, the respect. I was shaking over 40 people's hands every night before a show, training weekly, three training sessions a week, AA meetings, therapy sessions. I, my dad literally, <clears throat> I was a machine. I was a fucking machine, not even human. Almost. It, it was insane how hard I worked. And the one time I speak up and say no in a rehearsals to a fucking dance move, they got pissed. That one hits like a brick as well, because it's going right back to what we were talking about earlier to how. And Eric, this is why I removed it from the earlier one, because I wanted to give it time and attention here. Yeah, I was gonna, I'm seeing you going, uh, I don't know this. <laughs> <laughs> this was in the one I sent you. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I transcribed the whole audio. So. But, but this was definitely in there. But yeah, this is this is why I removed this whole spiel from the earlier clip because I wanted to give it its own attention. But so is there something here that, that anyone feels in the chat um, doesn't belong in this list of things? I'll give you a clue. She's listing things that she did to prove the point that she was – like overworked and being pushed to do all these things. And there's just one thing that just, Oh yeah. Well in tonality, you're right. Those of you saying literally killed me. And then yeah. the other says they got pissed. That drop in tone is yeah. definitely again from early what we we're saying, like when she, that emotion hits her, the voice goes down there. It goes this dark. It's like almost sinister. Like it almost sounds like someone who could be turned into like some Bond villain or something. Yeah. <laughs> Not to say that that's her, obviously, no, but like it, it's when that and it, it feels that, that dark. Yeah. So here's what it is. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. We're gonna take it from after they threw me away. So again, great observation for those of you who noticed that tonality shift. The moment she says, "They literally killed me." They threw me away. It's cold. It's like, it's so broken and it hurts. But here's what it is. I was performing for thousands of people. So let's make two lists. Lists of things that she was forced to do and other. So uh, I was performing for like thousands of people at night in Vegas. I had to do that. I'm going to skip this yeah. part. Um, I was shaking no, just, 40 people's hands every night before a show. I was forced to do that. Training weekly, I was forced to do that. Three training sessions a week, I was forced to do that. A meetings, I was forced to do that. Therapy sessions, I was forced to do that. I was a machine. I was an effing machine. But in the middle of that, towards the beginning, the it laughter, says, the joy, the respect. Yeah, Sorry. exactly. The laughter, the joy, the respect. What is that doing there? You're listening. She loved her fans. She just hate what she did. The rush of being a performer. The rush mm. of being a performer. So that's a positive. In the middle of a list of negative things that she had to do, we have this little positive. This The joy, the respect, the shaking of the 40 people's hands. And that to me is so significant. Because imagine someone going, talking to you about a really dark time in their lives, right? Like, let's say, um, I mean, I'll, I'll paraphrase this. So imagine I'm talking to you, I'm a performer, and I went through this really terrible thing. And they're saying, or, or someone who went through, let's say, drug abuse. And they would say something like, um, you know, I, I would wake up 
hours had gone by and I would, I, I would wake up in, in the house of someone I didn't even know. I was constantly in debt trying to pay for my drugs. Uh, I met some really awesome people and then keeps going. It's weird. Like it's weird when you're listing hardships to have this positive in there. To me, this is what this is. It's a silver lining that kept her going. It's the, it's that slight glimmer of hope that she needs because when she talks about this, we're seeing that tone shift. She feels like this killed her. They threw her away. They got pissed. But in all that, there's that one little light, which is the part, that little part remaining of what she liked to do. She literally needs to remind herself of the positive to survive this memory. Can I ask you a question? And and it's a way of looking at it. Um, What if this was a, think of it as a trade. She, She lists that first stuff in an entire sentence the performing for thousands of people. I, I, when you were listing your things that she was required to do based on just the review of this entire paragraph, I didn't throw the performing for thousands of people in the required to do list. I threw that based on her responses, thousands of people at night in Vegas, the rush of being a performance, the laughter drawer. Based on that, I took that sentence that says, I want a, and the second sentence was conditions for a R B. So let me, Mm. let me tell you why I disagree with that. It's because she says, she, she, go, she starts by saying, they literally killed me. They threw me away. That's what I felt like. Like my family threw me away. And now she's listing the reasons that support that, that she was just this robot. I was performing for like thousands of people at night in Vegas. So listen to the tonality in that. I don't think it's a positive thing. I think it's I... like, sorry, go ahead, Alita. No, 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 you, you finish. I don't want to interrupt you. Sorry. I, oh. Yeah. Um, you do. It's how we show love. Okay. Okay. (laughs) I know. Uh, but, uh, okay. So here's, here's what I was thinking is, so she's saying they literally killed me. They threw me away. That's what I felt like my family threw me away. And it almost to me felt like she was then saying like, but they threw me away. They discarded me, but I had all of this value. I was performing for thousands of people at night in Vegas. I had the rush of being a performer, the laughter, the joy, the respect I had. This is like, like talking about like how she felt like she had value in, in the things that she was doing. So like, and yet they threw her away. And then I was shaking over 40 people's hands every night before a show training weekly three training. And so it's like, it's like, I'm doing all of these things. And then my dad, literally, I was a machine. That's where, for me, where the transition is. But I don't know if... Okay, let, let's listen to it again. Because I feel like it's, she starts listing the things and then she puts that in the middle and, and it falls out. Let's, hmm. let's see it. And I feel like it's this odd positive in a sea of negative, right? Because hmm. before that, we have negative. Before, after that, we have negative. And in the middle, there's just this like little sentence of positive. So for me, that sure. fell right out. Let's listen to it again. Literally, I was a machine. I was a in machine. I skipped it, didn't I? They literally killed me. Okay, hold on a little bit more. Look, even down to the details of how many rhinestones are going to be in my costume. And I cared so much. And they literally killed me. They threw me away. That's what I I felt like my family threw me away. I was performing for like thousands of people at night in Vegas. The rush of being a performer. The So listen. No, the it's positive. Is, I'm, the, I'm with Rob on that. Oh, no, they, I think it's. I, I think was, that tone is still in that down sort of negative. It's in the tonality of the threw me away. She's not going back to that upper. She's climbing out. She's Listen, climbing. she's climbing there's, out. There's a deep breath. I was deep. performing for like thousands of people a night. The rush of being yeah. a performer. Blah blah blah. Okay. Then okay. into what the assignments were. Go, go ahead, play it again. Me away. I was performing for like thousands of people at night in Vegas. The rush of being a performer, the laughter, the joy, the respect. I was shaking over 40 people's hands every night before a show, training weekly, three training sessions a week, AA meetings, therapy sessions. I, my dad literally, I was a machine. I was a f-ing machine, not even human almost. It, it was insane how hard I worked. Mm-hmm. And the one time I speak up and say no in a rehearsals to a fucking dance move, Boom. they got pissed. Yeah, they got pissed. Yeah, hard. see, 
listening to it a second time, I mean, I even have a slightly different, different like way that I see this. I think that this is actually overwhelmingly positive, except for the and then they literally killed me. They threw me away. That's what I felt like my family threw me away. And then and the one time I speak up and say no in the rehearsals. It's it's like it's almost as if like she felt fine working that hard. Like she is she's a she's she's got a very strong work ethic. She just wants to have some damn control over it as as an adult and as a professional. It's a okay, parody. So I, no. I don't think I don't think she like okay. It's just it's hard to, for me to accept that she's listing three training sessions a week, AA meetings, therapy sessions as a positive thing that she. No, I think she it's was saying I like, did my part. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Part There's a pairing. Yeah. Look at the very start. How much it's effort like, and work I did. So she's saying, I did everything and they threw me away. Yeah. Then yeah. she goes to describe everything she did and then said, and then they got pissed. Right. So it's so like a, a listing duet. the things she did. Yes. <laughs> right. So, so then it still falls out to me. It's still, I, I know, sorry, I'm, I'm being stubborn. It's just um, the, the laughter, the joy, the respect that still falls out to me. Well, because I think that's, that's part of it. She's, well, she's performing for these people and getting the rush. I mean, it's in the same sentence. I was performing I for like crescendo. thousands. Of, it's, it's a bunch of people and I'm feeling it and, yeah. and I'm performing and I'm getting the rush. What, who, who is she getting wonder, the rush from the I thousands? If, I wonder if my, I wonder if my bias as a performer who's performed nightly for thousands of people is, is, is changing my analysis of this. Because to me, when I say like I was performing for like thousands of people a night, like to me, that's like, that's rough. <laughs> well, yeah, oh, I, see, I, I, I can see, I can see how you would, re I can see how someone who's, I can see how you're feeling that yeah. mm -hmm. when I'm just listening to it, there's an excitement. Listen yeah. to her, the pace, her pace changes. She goes boom, 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 boom. boom and then she does this dramatic pause and they boom, like okay. it was you insane. And they, I'm going to go with yeah. you on that. <laughs> see, it's possible to disagree and still be friends and love each other. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's a good example. Uh, so I'm going to go with you on that. So okay, fine. It's a crescendo. I like that, Alita. So we have, they threw me away. And to support that, it's, here's all these things I did. This was hard work. And then, um, and and because I said no to this one thing, they got pissed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do want to, I do want to talk about this. Now we're going to go back to my wheelhouse. Um the fact that she did all these things and the one time she stepped out of line and didn't want to do a dance move, they got pissed. I've never, ever seen that in any healthy relationship. I will tell you where I have seen that. I've seen it in abusive relationships. I've seen it in, I've, I've seen a lot of documents pertaining to MK Ultra or things like that, like very extensive brainwashing protocols that were eventually banned in military for extreme cases, for extreme psychological warfare. That's the kind of thing they do there. You're going to do this, this, this. And the second you step out of line, despite all this stuff you're doing, the second you step out of line, you're going to therapy. We have to fix that. We have to correct that. I've seen it in Ooh. cults. This is part of the psychology of cults. You're going to do all these things, but the moment you doubt it, the moment Nexium actually had something, I forget what they called it, but in Nexium, the moment you questioned the teachings or the process, you would have to go into this room with one of the, the, teachers or mentors or whatever the titles are. And you have to do this sort of cleansing process. The moment you doubt the process being punished, I've never seen that in a healthy relationship ever, only excessively scary relationships. This to me is a giant red flag. Mm -hmm. Eric, anything to add there? No, I mean, I, I agree. Um, also, while we're talking about cadence and breath and stuff like that, listen to just before she says they threw me away. We almost hear the anger. There's a short, sharp breath. Let's listen to it one more time. Just before they threw me away. So um, they literally killed me. They threw me away. And that that's anger. Listen to it. Some of you noticed that cadence, but... You may not know why you're feeling that. Listen to it. Again. My family threw me away. How much effort and work and heart I put in 
to what I did when I did work, even down to the details of how many rhinestones are going to be in my costume. And I cared so much. And they literally killed me. They threw me away. That's what I found. Did you hear that sort of that little, mm -hmm. they threw me away. So it's like darts. They threw me away. That cadence, that short through the nasal, uh, in anger, the, there's something called wing dilation or nasal flaring mm. where the nostrils open up for more oxygen intake. So in anger, in angry statements, we typically hear those bursts with nose of something, something, and they threw me away. So that, that's, that's anger coming through um, right there. Love it. Okay, I think we have just one more. Yep. Woo. Oh, yeah. She mentions, she says eight gulls of blood in this next one. I don't know what a gull, does she mean gallon? I'm... Uh, yeah, I don't know what that was. That was, was, that, was that tough for you too? Because I have no idea what she meant there. Yeah, it was odd. It, yeah. Okay. Uh, and and I do need Robin Alita to comment on this because if it's a gallon, if it's eight gallons of blood a week, she'd like be that, dead. What? She'd be dead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, mean when you go like, to donate <laughs> blood, you donate one pint. What's right. a pint in terms of gallons? Uh, there's eight pints to a gallon. Oh, eight pints to one gallon. And there's I think six pints in the human body. You give a pint right. when you go to donate, like a beer pint? Yeah. Yes. And there's eight of those in one gallon? Yes. Yeah. Two pints for a quart, four quarts to a gallon. Gallons. It's got to be Oh, Emily, Emily says in the chat she's clarified today to say vials. Oh. She's saying vials. Vials. Wait, okay. It. It vials. Like vials. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because I saw people in, in the comments say gallons. I'm like, it's not eight gallons. Nobody yeah. can do eight gallons of blood. I don't, I don't yeah, know. that's not possible. I don't know the math, but I don't know how many gallons of blood we have to begin with. So <laughs> it doesn't sound like she says vials, but, but let's yeah. listen. Oh, she, she, clar she clarified. Apparently. I remember one time I was backstage and I needed my inhaler. Oh, wait, sorry, 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 sorry. Eric, am I missing something? Did we skip this? No, we, we – yeah, this was early. That's why I got really confused when I said – um. It, it doesn't matter. We'll just go with it. Oh, I, no, this is, I only had one question about this. I only had one question about this one. So that's why it wasn't really in my notes. Um, really, let's cover this one really, really quick. Um, and I opened up to my assistant because um, I had my phone with me, which I'm not supposed to have my phone underneath the stage. But I said to her, you know what I'm doing. I was talking to a guy and he wanted to just leave the country with me. We had it all set up to just leave. And it was a secret relationship. And I said, my biggest fear was what would my dad do if I did do something wrong? What if I left the country? What and what if they found me? And what would they do? So um, I just have two, two things to say about this. One question and one 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 statement. The statement is uh, again we're seeing a bit of that scattered thought in the beginning of this, which is totally normal when we do these, you know, just monologues. But I remember one time I was backstage. I needed my inhaler. And then she goes on to talk about the phone and backstage. And I'm not really sure what that inhale statement is doing there. So it's kind of trying to get her thoughts together to go where she's trying to go. But we don't need any more evidence of that. It's, it's pretty present in a lot of the way she speaks, all the way she writes. Here's my question. How the heck did she maintain a secret relationship? Like she's talking about how she was observed when she was showered. She says in the recording that her phone was tapped. They were always listening in. She couldn't even call to hire her own lawyer without them knowing about it. How does she maintain a secret relationship that involves leaving the country? Meeting I think it's over 13 years. There was probably less or more oppression, depending on whichever point. Okay, so there was like sort and, of like a gap in that. Well, I'm just saying, you know, like yeah. early uh, and, on, and, she probably was really under the gun watching every move. But this could be six years. In. We're talking 13 years here. So yeah. things could have been a little looser or whatever. She's doing the show. People are doing things. And she, you know. Yeah, I, I just that's... there's also an innocence to to that observation. Like, I, keep in mind, remember what I do for a living. I'm a divorce attorney. People want secret relationships; they can make a secret relationship. There's very little that will motivate someone to secrecy and to go to ground than having a secret relationship. So I and say they will do. What? There's very little that will motivate someone to be more protected, guarded, and secret than a relationship that they don't want found. So, it, to the extent that she had any ability or that there were any capabilities of, of having a communication, whether it was handwritten letter, notes, et cetera, mm. whether it's speaking in code, they do it. Discovering this stuff is, I mean, it, it happens eventually, but 
people that want a relationship, they'll do just about anything to maintain it or have it. Okay, good point. Uh, I figured maybe like it was like a dancer from from the like someone that she was allowed be. to be around. Uh, anyway, I'm not be. speculating on that, but I just thought like it's because like if there's just a random person around, I feel like at some point with this conservatorship, somebody would be like, "Who the hell is this guy?" So I think maybe it was someone she was allowed to be with, and uh, also again, like she's a teen, right? Like this, a lot of her posts feel like diary entries. A lot of what she's saying, you feel like diary entries. It's like, dear diary, I have a secret lover. We're gonna run away, and like maybe it wasn't quite that. Maybe it was like she was talking to someone. They were talking about maybe like, but maybe it wasn't as concrete as she's making it sound. Maybe. I mean, the thing that jumped out to me most of all in this one, though, was her use of the word wrong. If I did do something wrong, what if I left the country and what if they found me and what would they do? It's like there's a black and white right or wrong to her decisions. It's like she like just doing something that she wants is considered wrong. And Good it's just gosh. like. Uh, I, I just she she's she's been either either she started off as a sweet rule follower or she has been it, it has been beaten into her metaphorically probably and I'm, I wouldn't you know suppose otherwise but like you know it, it, at some point she has gotten into this sense of thinking like I I either follow their rules or I am doing the wrong thing yeah what about her getting an inhaler when she's a smoker Anybody else? Want, I'm, I'm sorry, but there is a little bit of that element. Um, well, maybe people are on your case about smoking because you need an inhaler. Just, I'm just saying. I don't know. No, I, 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 I have a different theory. She, it's the assistant's phone. She's trying not to wrap the assistant out. That's why it starts with the inhaler and the assistant she's talking with because she had her phone with her, which she's not supposed to have, and then she goes to the phone under the stage and then. Chat led me down. I was trying to think about how she would pull off the relationship stuff. It was someone else's phone. Sorry, that's where the divorce attorney's brain goes. Yeah, <laughs> Rob, we're going to allow you to have this moment. Um, yeah, Alita, I, I couldn't agree more with your point. To do something wrong, so to refer to her doing what she wants as wrong, that goes back to what I was saying earlier. Uh, brainwashing protocols, MK Ultra, where resistance is seen as wrong. Like resistance is, I, I've stepped out of line. It's 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 a dangerous word for her to say that there. It shows to what extent this has been uh, pushed on her. Okay, we have one more, and then we're going to do the Super Chats. Giving eight galls of blood weekly, not being able to stand up. I was so, so, so weak. And my family's at my beach house. I was scared, broken. I'm sharing this because I want people to know I'm only human. I do feel victimized after these experiences. And how can I mend this if I don't talk about it? Again, to Alita's point, we're going back to the AA psychology. Like we mend things by talking about them. Sure. Um, th th so yeah, th it definitely suddenly like said eight galls of blood. So I'm guessing later on she clarified that it she's meant vials and, and Emily's saying it. And again, and Emily, we trust. So uh, <laughs> I don't know I'm calling her Emily. Shadow, sorry, Shadow D. Baker. Shadow. Um, Shadow has spoken. So I guess she went biles. We, I don't know why she said goals. Um, but I think that sums up the mission statement. There was injustice. And just by talking about it, it, it helps make it better. Uh, this, this is, I think, again, something she learned in AA and in sharing. Can we talk about this blood thing? Rob, Alita, was this mm -hmm. part of the conservatorship that she had to give eight vials of blood a week? That's I mean, possible. that's it, it, it could it could be it could be that they were doing that they were doing testing because of certain medications that she was on. It could be, you know, like like the, like, you know, for example, um, Accutane uh, is, is something that you have to get monthly blood tests because it's like essentially you you are pumping vitamin A into your body. And that's that's a that's a fat soluble vitamin. So it doesn't just flush out of your system. So you can get a, a toxicity to it really quick. There's there are reasons why you might need to get blood drawn on a regular basis if you're on certain medications. I mean, I wouldn't say that that's generally speaking a thing for conservatorships that that's like like a normal like I don't know like like an automatic thing. I should say athletes, maybe not normal, but automatic. athletes get a lot of blood taken too, and I consider yeah. her performance level is at a almost like an Olympian level fair. of that's of fair. you know the dance and the singing and everything else that 
she might have been getting levels checked in addition to whatever that might be in the conservatorship. She might have had to do it to make sure that her blood levels were okay. She wasn't deficient on iron, that she could hold up to the schedule through nutrition, et cetera. And by the way, folks, nobody said she doesn't have a right to smoke. She does. I'm just pointing out it's kind of ironic. I am a former smoker. I am not anti-smokers. I'm pointing out irony. Thank you. <laughs> the the blood draws can also be uh, a negotiated condition of voluntary compliance. It's like if she wants to be in control of taking the medicines on a on a prescribed basis and she wants to have that control, the a judge could basically say, I will allow you to take the medications at your own leisure and based on your schedule and the privacy of your house, I won't administer the, to them forcibly, but you have to submit to blood draws so that I can sh make sure you're being compliant. There's a bunch of different rationales for why this would happen or could happen. Yeah, uh, uh, Shadow D. Baker, thank you for clarifying that she later on IG said that she meant vials. Um, that's very valuable because it was racking my brains like, what the hell is a gall? Um, oh, 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 who did I, I, I did that? Hi, Rob. Oh, I, I got rid of Rob instead of getting me. I tried to click on Emily's comment <laughs> the moron, instead of the it's all the way up here. Rob, you can see yourself out. <laughs> oh, Gavin's got a good question. Gavin's question is good. Did she say giving eight vials of blood or they took eight vials of blood? Ooh, Gavin. Let's go back to it. Giving. Okay, so she gave. Okay, yeah, take that 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 would have been a that would have been crazy if she said they they took Gavin good call there. Um, there's another comment I wanted to address, but but it flew up. This is so confusing here. Um, I don't agree that KFED didn't go there in his interview. Why do the interview at all? Because he is scared she will fight for 50 50 custody and his child support payment will be will, oh. reduced. She's reduced. not she, guys. She's well. not getting 50 50 custody for a very 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 long time. That's just a very true fact. She has a lot of healing to do. She is doing that healing. Yeah. Well, the kids are 16 and 15. So in yeah, two years, adults, adults. an adult, in three years, they both are. And I think she alluded to that on Instagram, that, that, that those payments are going to end. I think uh, there was an allusion to that. Let me just clarify something. I wasn't saying KFED should have done the interview or not do the interview. Uh, I, I've stated clearly that I hate the fact that he allowed the kid to be on that. I hate the fact that she that they're bringing the kids into this at all, I despise. The only point I was making earlier is that that insulting thing she said about KFED, like, you know, ask your dad to go try and mow the lawn, like telling the kid, like, your dad's absolutely useless. He might feed that narrative to them off camera, but publicly he didn't flat out hit her in the weak spots and insult her and demean her. Listen, guys, I think we all saw my analysis of Kevin Federline. Um, I was very picky. The only thing I'm saying is he didn't flat out. You were mean, Spidey. You were mean to KFED. You, you're you're yeah. like anti KFED. You, you KFED hater, you. No, no, yeah. It's the nature of analysis. It's the nature of analysis. <laughs> it's the way it works. Um, you know, people are going to look at, people are going to watch both these videos and go, Spidey hates KFED. Spidey hates Britney. No, I, it's not that. I'm just analyzing. Do I think KFED should have done the interview? I, he decides to do it that once. I don't, I don't, you know, he decided to take an interview, talk about whatever they want to talk about. 60 Minutes offers you an interview, you do it. But while he was on it, he didn't say anything flat out demeaning uh, to Brittany. Yes, he implied the kids and they said some things that I didn't love. But And I think they both shouldn't have done that. But I'm not defending KFED in any way and saying, you know, again, I, I keep trying to think of the fact that we all have exes that we don't get along with. KFED's in a situation where his ex is Britney Spears. Yes, he's done a lot of really dumb things, but he was a teenager too. He was an idiot too. We excuse her behavior that way. Maybe we should give him a little bit of, and say, yeah, he was going through a lot of stuff too, you know? And yeah, he said some things, done some things, but we have to use the same objectivity for both. Either we're going to microanalyze each or neither. That's my piece. Let's do some super chat. Does that make sense what I just said? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Enough. Thank you, Miss Pete. Lucky. Hey, deal with the memberships, lovely Spidey. Advanced content is cool. That's the minimum. Number two is exclusive content. You have a huge following. We love you. Lucky, thank you so much. Love Lucky. Why, why, why does Lucky know more about how to run a YouTube channel than I do? <laughs> Once again, I'm going to talk to my consigliere over here. Thank you, Lucky, so much, though. I really appreciate it. 
My cat's name is Karen. Being the target parent <laughs> of parental alienation is simply hell. I've been dealing with it for over seven years, and it's awful. Please don't judge her too harshly. You're I, right. I can handle this one. Rob, go. Like the parental alienation stuff, I deal with this in custody cases all the time. You are 100% right. Parental alienation is a torture. It is it is murder to a parent to be alienated from your child. And you very righteously have anger towards the person that's doing the alienation. The problem is, is that both sides are very guilty of this. And I have to lay, I have to lay into my own clients who do this. And I, I under hundred percent understand their anger and frustration. They have justification for having that anger and frustration, but you, you don't get to use that as an excuse for either bringing the kids into it or engaging in further behavior or in furtherance of that. This cannot be a continuing self-perpetuating cycle. Um, judges will oftentimes say this when they look at one parent who's done something bad and the other parent gets up and says, you know, well, I did this bad thing because look what they judge says. No, 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 no. When it comes to kids, you do not get to excuse your behavior because of behavior of somebody else. You don't get to do that. That's why I, I have very critical opinions of what the direction that Instagram post went, as well as what Kevin Federline does. It's not a matter of who's doing it because of anything. You don't have an excuse. They're your kids. Agreed. And I think to a certain extent, our sympathy for Brittany can allow us to sympathize with certain things and say, we don't know what that's like. We don't know what it's like to have the amount of success she has. We don't know what it's like to have a conservatorship for 13 years. So we can excuse certain things and say, she's not in her right mind. And I, and I get that. I, I sympathize with that. And, and my cat's name is Karen. I, uh, I, I sympathize with your position of saying, please don't judge her too harshly because it can mess with your head. I get that. But I agree with what Rob said. It, it, it doesn't justify anything. I guess it justifies it in action to be like, I get why she did this. Yes. Doesn't mean it's, doesn't yeah. mean it's right. Correct. Alita, anything to add on that one? Same. <laughs> Very well put. It's yeah. She is decades behind because trauma arrested her development. She probably mm -hmm. won't be able to heal until she knows she is safe. Agreed. Almost hundred percent. Thank you for the super chat. And yeah, I think, I think everyone agrees with that. Eric, Rob, Alita. Yep. I think she, uh, yeah. what was it? Larry Burkhead. I personally think she needs to get off social as much as possible. Go somewhere where, where anywhere in the world, and yeah, the paparazzi will follow her for a while, but she goes somewhere where they're not normally at. They eventually go home. Just hang out for a while. And then the people in the locality, they get used to her. And then she's no longer having to worry about being a star. Just be a person. Just do boring things. Just hang out, do boring things, try to decompress and get away from the world. I, I think that it, she's not ready for the world yet. Honestly, she might be she might be onto something by auditing AA meetings. Oh, sure. Why not? Seeking out real companionship. It's not about that. Um, her lawyer has said that he's going to be looking into the conservatorship and bringing suit against Jamie. Um, mm -hmm. Is he protected? Rob Alita, is he protected? Uh, that case is that case is a nightmare. I will say this. Um, I, I watch almost every time Emily reviews one of these accountings. Um, because each one of those stories is just wilder than the last and trying to keep up with that litigation and how much trouble that previous attorney and Jamie Spears is possibly in. Um, that's a whole job and I don't know how Emily does it, but she does a great job of it. Uh, I, I know she does it. Emily's brain is much, much, much bigger than the rest of ours. Like, <laughs> like she's Fair. much. That's why she has purple hair is to contain. It's the, oh, that's, that's the way you contain it. Emily's just about, I'm still uh, shocked that, like, I was going to ask her to be on this panel, but I was like, I don't ask Emily for weekends because that's family time. So, em Emily, you're in trouble, Missy. We need to talk. You need, you need to come in on the stream. And <laughs> talk Brittany with us. Um, next, very much along the same lines, Coach Karen, it's like being in a coma for 25 years. She hasn't mentally sure. developed. She's stuck in time. So the way I describe this to people is like, Let's say I buy a new video game and I start playing that video game and I learn the mechanics a little and how to play it and I learn the basic moves or whatever it is and just the, just the basic entry-level stuff and I'm starting to learn. I'm getting a little bit better. But towards the beginning, I give the remote to Alita and I go, Alita, you keep playing. And Alita plays like a lot, like a lot, a lot. And she advances, unlocks new abilities, new things, gets way better at the mechanics. And she plays for like days, weeks. 
and gets really good at the video game. Then I come back. Really focused on this. <laughs> yeah. And then I come back and Alita just hands me the remote back and goes, Spidey, here, take it from here. And I'm standing there going, hold on, my, my skill level here isn't this. I don't know what to do here. Yeah. I don't know how to. So I panic. I, 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 I try this. I try that. I try different things. That's why I've been looking at it. It's like, you're, uh, so Coach Karen, it's you're saying really it's a coma for 25 years. For me, it's like it, there was this sort of takeover where someone else was running her life for, for 13 years. Then it was given back to her. The wheel was given back to her. And it's like, go. You can drive now again. And you're like, but I don't, I'm entry level. I don't know what to do here. So I really sympathize with that. And it breaks my heart to see this struggle that she has to try to figure out, okay, I don't, I don't know how to do this. And I do and that. Yeah, go. No, 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 no. You, you go ahead. You go ahead. And I think this is why I excuse people who blindly defend her because I do think she needs our support to take the wheel back after 13 years. So in in a lot of cases, when I see subjectivity, I go, no, stop it. Don't be subjective. We have to look at it from all angles. I do have sympathy towards her because I hate what happened to her. And there's a part of me going, we should be on her side to help her heal from this. Whatever she, whatever that is. I think Eric is right. I think she needs to disconnect from everything, hit that reset button. But I, I including like us, I, by the way, just go us. away, just go live. You know, yeah. you get, get help to work, work, work it through. Don't, don't worry about us. Don't worry about anybody. Just do your own thing. I, and, and something about that too, is that her life has a certain level of complexity that most of us probably can't even comprehend. Exactly. Right. Like, like she's, she lives a life that requires a certain number of people helping her in a lot of different ways. And so when she hasn't even, so that requires certain managerial skills to be managing the people that are running your life. And so when you've had somebody else that's been doing that, not just for 13 years, but also for the years during your youth and your upbringing, that's like suddenly being thrust into that from being a baby to all of a sudden being the manager of some massive, you know, like corporate (laughs) empire in some respects that like, it's like there are certain skills that just have not been developed on top of just like being an adult and managing social relationships and managing just normal, like normal things that, that an adult of her age would be doing. Yeah. Uh, on this, Eric, you got to go. Yeah, I do. Uh, Robin elite Alita, you are more than welcome to uh, stick around to do just a few more uh, uh, super chats we have here or, or mm-hmm. you, I can oh. stick around. Cool. Eric, yeah, see you, buddy. thank you so much. Sorry, Eric. Man. Wonderful to get your perspective here. Everyone go follow Eric Hunley. And this panel, yes, please, every, I'm the every, tiny channel. I'm the little baby channel that, stop that it, tries. Stop it, stop it. I mean, <laughs> he gets this panel on Thursdays. So all, oh, my battery's going to die again. If, if, I, if it goes blank, <laughs> forgive me. Um, so, yeah, please go. Here's Eric's uh, link. There it is. Uh, every Thursday, we're, we're on his channel, and we talk fun stuff. So, so you can join us there. There's already a bunch backlogged. Um, Eric, thank you so much for your perspective. Thank you, sir. Always, always appreciate you. Have a great evening. Cut himself off there. Oops. Ah. Um, okay. What's happening? Ah, I got to do this in order. What's KFED going to do when the child support runs out? Listen, he was a really, really good dancer. Maybe he can go back to that. No. Okay. Just me. I, I'm just. I'm I, sorry. My 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 to, brain just flashed. To him, it's up to him to decide. It's. I'm yeah. gonna replace my battery, Alita, and Rob. I was just, I was just saying my, my, and I, I this, I don't want to be like, you know, snide or anything about it, but it's like I, my brain just flashed to some more current images of him, um, and his current physique that is just not, not exactly the same as what it was when he was a backup dancer from Britney Spears. I have gladly not seen any of that stuff. So I will just let your brain do that. I'm just going to say he can figure it out when that time comes. So Arita, uh, I will say this. I saw the and it's movie. not to body shame anyone or no, anything. No. I'm just I, thinking. I saw I saw the movie Thor Love and Thunder. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of Endgame, Thor was a was a big boy and he works yeah. out hard and he yeah. figures it out and he gets back in shape and he goes back to being the awesome god of thunder. So if Thor if Thor can do it. K-Fed can maybe try. I mean, he's not exactly the god of thunder, but sure. <laughs> the god of the thunder thighs. 
Rob just had a perfect explanation. Great work, Spidey. Uh, I don't know which explanation you're talking about, but Rob exclusively has perfect explanations. <laughs> this is my plan. Just bring people that are way smarter than me on the channel to <laughs> back off their brilliance. And there's two great examples right here. Um, the thing that gets me is that she posted stuff and deleted it like, uh, like it will take it away. That's what teenagers do, in my opinion. It's like she doesn't understand mm. the internet. Yeah, so that's, once again, that scattered thinking, kind of posting, taking it away, ah, getting, you know, uh, no impulse. Again, the prefrontal cortex, impulse control. That's a big, big part of it. And it develops it, when we're in our 20s, so. It could also it could also be, though, her issue with, with trust, with the things that she puts out into the world and how that is picked up and handled by the, by the media, by other people, by commentators, you know, because – you know, Perez Hilton tore her to shreds. The regular media did TMZ. Yeah. So yeah. She's she's learning. She got dropped into the deep end and she's literally in the scariest place to learn. Like she is in yeah. the scariest place to learn. When she says something out loud, it's not like your parents catch you saying the F bomb and you get your mouth washed out with soap. When she says something out loud that she hasn't learned is going to be taken a certain way. She gets the entire world coming down her throat. That And that was not the purpose of this analysis. This is just to kind of help us understand where she might be and how she's dealing yeah. and processing these things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Aristoneda. What if Brittany just has ADHD considering her scatterbrain and how she writes her posts? Also, I love this channel. You're awesome. Spidey, thank you so much. It's very kind of you to say. Thank you for the super chat. It's possible. So there are things here. Like I don't want to diagnose because I haven't spoken to her. She's been in the same room as me. Um, and... ADHD is one of many things that can explain this kind of scattered thought. It's very possible. Um, you're, you're, you're not wrong. It's an option. Her IG posts, maybe it's just how she writes. Yeah, uh, it is just how she writes. She's always- Stream of voted. consciousness. Stream of consciousness. She writes the way she speaks. They're, they're, I, I feel like she hits enter a lot of the time without proofing. Um, Agreed. Mm -hmm. One thing I wonder about is how much of her communication <laughs> style is due to less development and how much is due, bless you, Alita, Thank development you. and how much is due to her illness. It could be both. It could absolutely be both. Uh, I, I think it is both. Um, first of all, we don't know for a fact what the illness is. So we have to be very careful before saying or, her illness. Or technically if she even has one. Yeah, that's a good point. Her life experience, what her life experience has led her to be at this point. Exactly. I, th I think I, th I think there's stuff going on in there that affects the way she communicates. But I think that the arrested development really contributes to that as well. It's it, she argues the way teens would. Fish in Tennessee, Eric, respectfully, I disagree. Well, he's gone. So the reaction is that oh. I understand it. Even if she did something that wouldn't such an intense display if she wasn't who she is, no matter what she did, she didn't deserve that. Does anyone know what we're talking about here? I think it might be about the deserving, the accountability. I think this, this harkens back to some of the accountability stuff. He, you know, wishing that there would be some accountability for the action. I, I just go back to the, the characterization of a punishment and her understanding of this as, as a punishment. She's going, she's continuing to process this. We need to allow her to process this. It, it's, it's hard that she has to do this in the public eye. Well, that she's choosing to do it in the public eye. True. Yeah, but, she, but, I mean, but, but like Rob said, so there's people who are going to say, well, no, she didn't choose to do it in the public eye. She retaliated on the public eye. But that goes back to what Rob said. One's actions do not justify your reaction. Yeah. But what, what choice does she have? She can't really deal with this in silence either. I, I'm not so much it, against her going on Instagram to defend what she feels is right. I'm against her bringing the kids into this, even if they were brought in before her doing that. It's just for me, like, talk, we want to know what you're going through. We want to be there. We want to understand. But it's just for me, like, yeah. insulting their father and, you know, my dear boy, read a book. That, that stuff I could live without. But again, it's an impossible, it's an impossible request. And I say, I, I, I said sure. that I was critical of both sides. Asking people to put up with that level of, of pain of having your own child make comments, asking them to do that and to do it yeah. silently, it, it's almost impossible. But it is yeah. an expectation. And as parents, you kind of have to do the impossible all the time. You're a parent. You have to do the impossible. I get it. 
I, I, I totally understand. And that's what I said earlier, Rob. Like, I understand the behavior doesn't make it right. Mm. What about her being in the back of someone's car? What about her being in the back of someone's car? Dragged and transported all different places. I mean, there was, I, I'm not, I don't want to speak to something that I don't have context yeah, I don't, for. I wish I did. Yeah. I'm not sure what that's about. Thank you. Could this have been originally done to share with her ghost author for the upcoming autobiography and she decided to share on her social media? I would explain some of the verbiage she used. Interesting. Interesting. Why wouldn't she just send it in private to her ghost author? I think I think that what they're saying here is that maybe she just had this excerpt that she decided that she wanted to make public. I don't know. It's so much of it just feels very, like I said earlier, stream of consciousness. It feels very emotional. Like I am, I'm getting this out now because I'm feeling this in this moment. Yep, I agree. It's bleh. for so long I couldn't speak. Now I will speak. More vomit. It's it's the same. It's the same as the naked photos. The same as shaving your head. It's. I will say whatever the hell I want to say. And I, and I get it. She is younger than me and became famous when I was a freshman. She deserves a lot of leeway from being so handled. Madonna was older. Agreed. When you have no friends because others are controlling you, you are desperate for social contact. So A would have been a haven for her. Yeah, I think Probably, we touched on yeah. that. And mm -hmm. Probably. And agreed. The, the importance she placed on connecting with other stories and them opening up, inspiring her to open up, 100%. Yeah, and something about that too is that it, it, what she said about about people sharing just to share. Yep. I think that I think that maybe the significance of that was that there was no transaction involved. There was nothing that was asked in return. People were just giving. Yep. It's going back to that concept of openness. Like they were just being open for the sake of being open and that's what again inspired I think this whole speech. And it also stands in, in, in juxtaposition to her relationship with her family, how she goes through the whole list of things that everything that she did with her work ethic, from, from picking out the rhinestones to the costume to, to, you know, doing these massive shows in Vegas and shaking 40 pairs of hands and, you know, all of this stuff. And then like, you know, and then them throwing her away. There's a, there's a certain value and transaction sort of element to, uh, I think, a lot of what she's feeling here. Good call. Love it. Absolutely. Jenny's getting inky with it. Sounds like she's been conditioned. Absolutely. That goes back to MK Ultra, all the psychological sort of this moment you step out of line, we're doing something about that. 100%. Kat from the Kong. Is it possible her mental health issues may have distorted or amplified her perception of what was happening to her? Of course. Again, I would recommend you go on Eric Conley's channel to the video the four of us did just earlier this week on Thursday. Um, of course. Trauma really messes with memory perception even the way not just the way she perceived it in the moment but the way she will remember it now can very much be resolved again mental health issues i don't know what they are but whatever she's going through could very much distort her perception and her memory yes i used to want to be her when i was a teenager but now my heart breaks for her i think same <laughs> yep alina you wanted to be britney spears i could see it Heck yeah <laughs> I, I, I see you doing the, I see you doing the pigtails and like the <laughs> choreography. Do -do 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 yeah, of course, of course, of course. Who didn't? <laughs> um, my friend went through a messy divorce and told us all the crap he pulled, but she still talked well of her ex to her kid because he was still their dad. Yeah, I, that's. I appreciate seeing that. I appreciate when even when the parents don't get along, for the sake of the kids. They still try to stay polite towards the other parent. Um, I think your friend is awesome for doing that, Heather. She's had be silent secretive for so long that I'm not surprised she does everything publicly now. I'm not referring to anything about the kids here. That's different. Thank you guys for doing this live. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I think we all agree and touched on this. Just sort yeah. of, we just said it. Yeah, coming out publicly. Totally. I love that we're all like, even in the comments, like I love how there was ups and downs where we disagreed on certain things, but at the end of the day, the bottom line remains the same. She went through hell. We understand this need to just open up. Um, some of it sometimes may be out of place. You should, you know, be careful with bringing the kids into this. But at the end of the day, we get, we get what's happening. 
And, and again, I, I feel like a lot of her fans in the chat will continue to support her. Um, but again, it's okay to say, we get what you're doing, doesn't mean it's always right. When she was giving the blood, it was when she was put in the institution and they were on high levels of lithium. That makes perfect sense. They would need to monitor that very closely. Oh, thank you, big heart. And last one, last one. The song Lucky hits so much different these days. Oh man, I didn't even think about that. You guys know her song Lucky? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. so lucky, she's a star, but she cries, 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 oh, my cries God. And a lonely heart thinking. Alina, go, it's your moment. You can keep going, Alina. Stop. Um, no, now, now, now I'm forgetting the lyrics. <laughs> if, if this is come at night, pitch change, and yeah. This um, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Dang it. I should have I should I should have done my research for this. <laughs> next time. Next next time. We're gonna do yeah, yeah, live. Yeah. Emily's gonna be here. It's gonna be very exciting. And Alita is we'll do there. we'll do we'll do a Britney karaoke. Yes. Uh, anyway, you will do Britney karaoke. No, you will do Britney karaoke. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. This is a great way to end this. Lucky is, was was a was a terrific song, and yes, it hits different when you listen to it now. That whole it was all about a facade, the performing facade, but she was suffering inside. And and Caitlin, yeah. wow, that's such a great point. Didn't dawn on me till right now. Pardon me while I end the stream and and be sad about that for the rest of the day. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. This one was more almost two and a half hours. Oh my god! What, Alita? What? You have one last super chat that came in. Yeah. <laughs> One last super chat. I think the album called TV show called is her making sure she's not being misunderstood. She's being extra clear. Could be, could be like the album called. I mean, yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't think anybody thought how much your mother could be anything else, but it's possible that she's like the album called circus. Maybe she meant like not the song could, could very well be. I just felt it as more of like Alita said, a disconnect from what's going on out there. And a lot of her language suggests that, but, but thank you for that perspective. I, I always appreciate different perspectives. Thank you everyone for, for uh, tuning in. Rob, Alita, you guys are amazing. I can't thank you enough for giving this much time to my channel. You are Thanks the absolute best. Thank you for best. having us. Happy to do it. Thank you for having us. Everyone, please subscribe, hit that like, comment. Uh, this is a long one, but I'm so glad you were all here for this. Had a blast and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much, everyone.